30 days of coaching is still available for free at mindpumpmedia.com. This is what you get with the 30 days of coaching, okay? So every day we send you a new subject. Actually, in the beginning, I think we send them all, uh, all right off the bat, right? Yep. Um, and these are the subjects that we cover. Obviously, your basics like proteins, carbohydrates, fats, sugar, water, fiber, cholesterol, calories, and supplements. But then we get into things like nootropics, artificial sweeteners, how to program better with resistance training, imbalances, connectivity, mobility, aches and pains, programming. I mean, it goes crazy. We get into wellness. We get into your relationship with food. Uh, it's, it's free information. It's fantastic information. Uh, we give you bullet points on each of those subjects. And then we connect you to our episodes where we talk in detail about those subjects and we timestamp them. So you can listen to the episode and we tell you, hey, at five minutes and 30 seconds is when we start to cover nootropics. So listen at this time. So and then it's organized in a nice glossary too that you guys get. So there's direct links. So there's those specific topics that Sal was just talking about. If you want to go straight to one and you mm -hmm. want more information on that topic, you now have a nice reference tool. So I normally, when people sign up for this, I say, listen, keep this in your library. That way, anytime you want to share with somebody else that wants it, has a question regarding one of these topics or you want to go back and dive deeper into it, you have all that plus the studies and links connected to it. An incredible amount of, uh, of information. In fact, it's taken us well over two years to produce all this content to provide for you guys for absolutely free. And it's free. So you just, all you got to do is go to mindpumpmedia.com and just opt in and that's it. And then you'll get it all. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Oh man, Whoa, you, where you are we guys, going? You guys are on or in, not on. You're in for a treat right now. So mm. sit back, grab a glass of wine, maybe some shrooms, maybe some LSD. <laughs> what? <laughs> Something nice, you know, like, like make an experience out of this one. Or you, you know? could just relax and have a glass of water. Uh, <laughs> we interviewed Mike Bledsoe. I don't, yeah, we're not promoting that, sorry. Mike Bledsoe, who uh awesome guy. He's a host of a couple podcasts. Barbell Shrugged is one of them. We didn't really the, talk about fitness. The, the Bledsoe <laughs> Show is another it. one. He's a very interesting person. It's funny when we meet someone. Very from, intelligent dude. Very intelligent. And when we meet someone who's in fitness, we're always a little bit like, okay, how's this going to go? We're going to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, we're just going to talk about squats and deadlifts and whatever. This episode, What's your bench? this episode went crazy. Well, there was a lot of, let's talk about first, there was a lot of posturing for the first hour to two hours of the show because what was so great was he had the same feeling coming in to meet us, right? So it's like, you know, we, we get, it's almost like being put on a blind date, right? Yeah. We, mm. You know, the, our, exactly our, our people called his people, his people send them yeah. over to our people. He sees three really handsome, yeah. smart guys. Right. You come, you come in, we can be very intimidating. <laughs> we're wearing halter tops. Yeah. You know, so he we're came, trying to show ourselves off. He came in and he was kind of feeling us out. You could tell we were doing the same thing. We and feel then, like we were all feeling each other out. Yeah. Up. A lot of feeling going on. Yeah. And then you realize that like, oh my that God. That led to more feeling. We were, were like buddies dude yeah, like yeah. instantly yeah. very like once dude. once we yeah once we all got on like started talking everybody kind of like it was one of those moments where you look at each other like did we just become best friends <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean we had knuckle bump we but, had a great time there might have been some alcohol involved but uh it was a great conversation the whole time oh, it was yeah. a long episode we talked a lot about a, a lot of great things well we did we we dive into some things that of course and i know it's going so if you're somebody who doesn't like talking about uh and that's why i made the joke about the lsd and the mushrooms things like that we talked about ayahuasca experiences we talked about uh the the, the, the rave right now mm. with microdosing and things like that we got we had a very open discussion you just let it go wherever it we did to. talk business though there was we did talk a lot of business there, yeah. yeah no that the, probably the most beneficial stuff as far as that's really is definitely the biz, business talk if you yeah. were if you're looking for uh, a major health and fitness podcast episode like this probably isn't one of those but for sure entertaining yeah i thought it was great i got a lot of great information from him uh, via business this guy's been doing podcasting for quite some time yeah, they're very OGs. very successful what they do and he was very open and honest about their business and the pivot that they had to make and you know, so I love getting to talk to somebody like that who will share all that information. So those of you that are entrepreneurs will enjoy this episode a yeah, lot. Yeah, and you can check out his podcast, The Bledsoe Show. That's the Bledsoe spelled B-L-E-D-S-O-E. -E. You can find him on Instagram at Mike underscore Bledsoe, and you can go to uh, the website, which is www.thebledsoeshow.com. So without any further ado, here's Mind Pump having a great fucking time with Mike Bledsoe. So Mike, you and your you and your partner, you're you're kind of like the more are you more the business guy? Do you are you like there cuz I feel like with the three of us there's, you know, one of us is like the really smart guy, one of us is one of the really good looking guy. <laughs> 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 
rooms. Like, like, you know, do you guys have that? Do you guys have that similar most, dynamic? We, we definitely awesome. have uh, different skill sets and personalities that allow us to complement each other really well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anyone's more of a business guy. I, I, uh, I don't know. How do you define business? Well, well okay. So pr- a good question. Pre- before you guys got together, were you all serial, serial entrepreneurs or was one of you an entrepreneur and the other guy came from the business world? Like, how did that? Happen? Oh, we were all, we all knew nothing. And <laughs> we, uh, we were, oh, in 2007, I opened up a gym with one of my, so I have a few business partners and uh, one of my business partners, we opened a gym together in 2007 and I just don't think he knew any better and he wanted <laughs> to help out and he's like, uh, it's fun. It's a gym. And I, well, in the first year and a half, I th- he was on deployment most of the time. Mm. And so I ended up running the place by myself. I would not have identified as a business guy when I owned a business mm. uh, initially. And over time, I've just realized my role in the business. And where I think a lot of people who don't like you know business in quotations, it's because they associate it with what they teach businesses in college. And mm. so... Good, uh, good point. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and for me... Uh, just me being me is doing business, in my opinion. Yeah. And so, like, everybody has their role in the, in the company. And, you know, just because I'm not sitting in front of, like, spreadsheets or anything like that doesn't make me any less business. No, no, no of course. Yeah. No, you, you said something interesting that uh, how everybody ha- knows their role. I find, because I've worked with, I've had partners in the past, I've had teams in the past, and the most effective teams and partnerships I've ever had were, was where everybody had, you know, strong ego, but at the same time, everybody knew their place and what they were good with yeah. and good at. And it wasn't this competing like, no, I have to do that too. And it's like, okay, you're sure. better at that. You do this. And you guys found that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we definitely understand that. And it's evolved over time. And we've, we've realized strengths that we didn't know we had and, and things like that. And, and really allowing the other person to grow into their stuff and, and, you know, them letting me grow into my stuff. And I, I was talking about just being, everything's being business because I don't, oh man, should I, should I let everyone know we smoke weed before this? Sure. So I'm going to, yeah. You can out us on this. Uh, our, our, our audience doesn't know we smoke I, weed. I, <laughs> Are you kidding me? I, I, may, I may have lost track of what I was saying. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why I was okay. bringing Well, listen, up. you know what? You know, this reminds me. This reminds me of the transition that I went through. Oh, I like, because I was, I was in, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was leading teams when I was 22 years old, right? So I remember thinking, like, I could, like, carry the club. Like, I would go mm. into a club. And, yeah, and yeah. I, w- I would turn a club around by myself. I could yeah. hit the revenue and I'd be like, and I could always figure out one or two motherfuckers would get on board with me and we would smash this goal and we'd right. keep going. And then as I got older, I realized I just got fucking tired like, of, of oh, leading yeah. this way. Yeah, and, and that's what we do well is we all agree on the goal. And so I think most people that feel like there's somebody in the business that isn't a business person, mm-hmm. it it's not that they're not a business person. It's just they're not working for the same reason. Right. They don't have the same goal. They're not, they they're, don't have the same goal. They want something else to happen, and they, they're not telling you. That's actually a very smart um, way to put it, and that makes plenty, perfect sense. Because in the past, when I've worked with people who didn't have the same goal as me, I'm just like, well, this fucker's lazy. or Yeah. You know, but in reality, they just, yeah. they just wanted different things yeah. out yep. of it. Totally. Different no, idea. Yeah, nobody's lazy. Everybody, if somebody appears to be lazy, they're just doing the wrong thing. Mm. Yeah. What what is your opinion of the current state of the fitness industry? That's a loaded question, but um, I, I think we're transitioning. I think there is a, a transition in how the marketing is being done. Um, how? So up to this point, um, most marketing has been uh, basically the way the language works is uh, you point out how they're that person's not good enough. And then uh, say, hey, I got this thing that'll make you good enough. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, and that's, that's just how marketing has worked in the past. We all know a negative, yeah. um, you know, and an avoidance is twice as motivating as, you know, trying to pull somebody mm-hmm. along. And I think that uh, consumers, especially in the United States and people that have just been connected to the internet long enough, have become more, more sophisticated buyers. And so I think that the market's going to have to move more towards... Uh, making the consumer, uh, the client, whatever, the hero of their own journey and the brand who's selling them something has to set themselves up as the mentor to that hero. And I think that the way most businesses are being run right now, the brand sets them el- themselves up as the hero. And then it leaves mm-hmm. the potential customer to just be a spectator. 
you you create with the, with what you're talking about. You create a, a fan base or a consumer base that is very very loyal and strong right, um, right. when they believe that they're a part of. It's that whole garage band. Well, it's you know, we, we also have the ability to do that that we weren't able to do that ten years ago. Sure. You, now we have the ability to where we could be connecting to people on seven different platforms live, and I mean it can be and then instantaneously given to you like the the ability to reach out and touch somebody on. This volume now is crazy. We were talking about this a little bit before the show, which is authenticity. And so what the fitness market has not had up to this point is authenticity. Oh, 100%. 100%. Right? That's, that's yes. like the basis of motiv- It's what motivated and, and my is, pump raw truth. And this is why every fitness brand has such a short lifespan. And, you know, the supplement companies have really high turnover in regard to branding because none of them are authentic in nature. Uh, well, I won't say none of them. Most of them, the big brands, the ones that are doing the most volume, aren't that authentic in nature. It's a lot of flash, a lot of promises, and the product is bullshit. Mostly subpar. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes supplements can be really good, but you got to know what you're, how you're using them, and why you're doing it, and all that shit. But most supplement companies are just flash and pants. And, and not to mention, they get then they get tested yeah. and they come back and they're like, oh, it has none of what you said. Like something else. It's got toxic shit in it. It's got heavy metals or whatever. Here's this protein powder that's spiking their protein to make it seem like there's more grams of protein. Like, you hear shit like that and it's like, it's, it's no wonder that the market is starting to but change. It no, has to. Nobody knows who's running the, the... Like the average person consuming a certain protein probably doesn't know who even owns the company or... There's no message that no comes with it. Yeah. It's just they hire fitness models and they hire bodybuilders and uh, and sponsor athletes that are unrealistic. And so I think that what's going to be happening and what is actually already happening and due to a lot of what we're doing right now in social media is there's a lot of people getting very real and transparent. And the the typical magazine you see on the rack at the store is getting way less attention than that person who's got a really nice, solid message that, that really wants to help people is going to start outshining. And again, you know, doing the flashy, inauthentic thing, you can get big real quick, but you're going to come yeah. down real quick. They're always going to battle that And they ass. don't... And, well, <laughs> that ass is Dude, there. booty short shots. I mean, I, I know you guys are frustrated with it, too. Oh, my God. Same like, I did like... Some can't compete, dude. Yeah. I, I, like, meditated for two hours. I came out of it. I, this is the best piece of advice. I got the two hours of meditation, 29 likes. And then, and then some chick yeah. posts a booty shot, and it's like... 50,000. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like... And then she tells people to eat... You know, a, a supplement. Yeah, yeah. fit D. Like, so yeah. fit D, right? Yeah. Yeah. But and, over and time, then, over yeah, time, that's going to play out. And then her bio yeah. is like Proverbs too. You know, yeah. Proverbs. <laughs> so you know, that makes me want to just so, burn the house down. Oh <laughs> man, what you're right? what you're saying, I think I could probably speak for us. Is I I know I don't I couldn't agree more in terms of what fitness needs to do now in terms of connecting to the consumer, the realism, the authentic, authenticity. Yeah. Do you think, cause you're very heavily involved uh, in the kind of quote unquote early days of CrossFit. Do you think that was one of the pieces of the recipe that made CrossFit succeed so well in the early days was that connection and authenticity? Yeah. I, well, I think it was the first people to make the claims they were making and they were the first ones to define fitness and then, which was huge. And then they posted workouts every day. I think that's what got him going. Mm. Um, what was it that you asked that do, what was helpful? Yeah, do you... Th- it's the weed kicking in. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> some good shit. The, the, <laughs> you know, we talked about the authenticity, the connection, yeah. the knowing. Oh, I think people stay for, you know, and, and so you got to like, I, I think about CrossFit and the CrossFit because community, it's a community is a separate thing. You see, and you say that, a CrossFit community. You but don't hear gym, that about other things. Each you know? gym has its mm. own community. Mm. And so, yeah, I think people show up because they're curious or... They really are out of shape and fat or whatever, and they want to get in shape. And then once they get there, you know, most people want to lose weight because they, they want to be able to connect with other human beings, and they feel like they can't connect because they're not attractive. So then they have to go to a gym, which is highly intimidating, and then they walk in, and they just want to be accepted. And they walk in, and they realize that they're, they're accepted without having to lose all the weight. Mm-hmm. And so I think they stay for the community. Mm. Yeah. Now, somebody like you, though, like we were talking before outside, and you were talking about yeah, I want to like, get into like your when, we, when you when you yeah, you came from Olympic from lifting. Olympic, you walk yeah. in, you saw CrossFit, and you're like, oh fuck, nobody's doing this right, or not hardly anybody. And you see, not what, many. At that, what's going through yeah. your head at that point? You're like, I see a huge opportunity for myself, or do you battle with that? You know, as you know, knowing that kind of knowing that, like, do maybe half these people maybe shouldn't be doing this? I, what, I wouldn't even say I recognize it as an opportunity. It was just like I thought I could help 
And then I remember my weightlifting coach was, he would ask me things like, oh, do you really, like, I really don't think going into cross is a good idea. Everyone's doing it so badly. And I'm like, yeah, of course. I mean, that's, it's like a perfect, op- you know, or I don't know if I use the word opportunity, but I was like, that's why they, There's they're going to be there. doing it anyway. Yeah. We should be there to help them out. Right. So, mm. hey, uh, when you look at CrossFit now, how how is it different than what it was when you first got into it? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot bigger, obviously. Oh yeah, it's changed. It's uh, it's matured. Um, it's gone through some growing pains. It's it's been interesting to watch. What were some of the biggest growing pains that you saw? <sighs> um, I, I say the the one that's happening now. There's a new, the CrossFit market is moving into a new phase. So the phase it was in was it's okay to be dirty, it's okay to be mm. grungy and this and that, and it's hitting mainstream enough to where that's not good any good enough. Interesting. Anymore. And so it's moving into a what I'm calling a, it's a professional phase. So it's it's not been a professional industry up to this point. It, in fact, I mean, if you rewind a decade, everyone, including myself at the time, were prided ourselves on not being professional. Mm. Is it like it was so good we could get away with dumb shit hmm. that no one can get away with these days because there's a motherfucker on every corner, and if you do too much dumb shit, they're just going to go to the guy next door, and so now what you have is and you have it's gone mainstream, so there's more average Joes showing up. So the big opportunity right now is for gym owners to step it up and you know keep it clean, uh, have professional environment and a professional coaches coaching and. It just needs to be professionalized, and that's beginning to happen. That's the latest like phase. How shift are they now? How are they exerting that <clears throat> influence? Because it's a it's not like a franchise in the sense that they're not. That's that's what I was gonna say. That's yeah. got to be a problem, right? Because yeah. you've got some clubs that are, um, you know, that are well, operate well, so differently. I, from I, I do think it's problematic for the CrossFit mm-hmm. brand mm-hmm. for sure. Mm. So. It's greater opportunity that, for the owner. If you're a business owner, it's you yeah. have way more freedom to do what you want and create your own culture. Yeah. So this is this is where you know CrossFit has stayed out of the business side of the house, which has created a huge opportunity for someone like myself to come in and help out and help professionalize things. I have a sense that they may re- have regretted that they didn't have more like business systems to give people, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure that I don't know if they re- regret would be the right word, but I think they saw see the opportunity now that that could have been a thing, but it's kind of coming past because they just let it go so easy and there's always been concerns of um of whether um there should be some type of quality control and the, and that's been a conversation amongst all the gym owners and because there's not been any quality control i think there's been more innovation in the market as a whole mm-hmm. but the brand as a whole is probably is not as shiny as one thing that's a great point yeah with you on was your um your take on on doing an overhead snatch and kind of like Tell, tell, tell like your average person coming in, like what are your thoughts on teaching that move, on performing that move, or programming that move? Yeah, so with uh, something like a snatch, uh, most people don't need to be doing it their first like even two or three months of doing CrossFit a lot of times. Maybe not ever, you know, and that's a very complicated movement and uh, it's, you need to be athletic in order to do it, which means that your muscles need to fire in order, which most people don't. Um, in the right order, and you have to have uh, the requisite amount of mobility to get in the positions for that. Both Do you of see which, a lot of mobility it, happening nowadays in CrossFit? There's boxes? way more mobility yeah. now. Way more people that are that sounds that are like a gro- that was a growing it. pain there. I think because yeah. there was a period there that, was. That, that, that was that was that was the first thing I noticed. That was outside. when Kelly Stark came along. He that was that was another that was a big shift in the market because that was a spur. That, that was a spur in the heel. Have that you we ever were have you ever hung out with Kelly? Have you yeah. talked to him? Okay, so. I've always I've only seen his interviews. Is he he I kind of feel like he's he, he kind of reminds me kind of like talking to you about CrossFit. It's not like uh, you guys you guys see the business opportunity of it. You like it. There's a lot of things you like about it, but you also what you see too is how much things need to get better and change. Like yeah. is he like that off air? Is that what is how do you feel like what's his view on CrossFit? Now I know it's made him a huge name because he's a totally the yeah. guy. He's the mobility he, he guy when it comes guy. to yeah, right? CrossFit, right? When I talk to him, all he talks about is the changes he wants to make. Yeah. Mm. That's it. Like, so I don't really, I don't, we don't sit and talk about, or we have not sat and talked about CrossFit or the state of the market yeah. so much as it is just like, well, for Kelly, you know, it's like, I just want to get people at standing desks instead of sitting desks. He already got the CrossFit thing going. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's not even what he's thinking about now. Mm. Yeah. He's already, he's already, he's going mainstream. Like, well, he already did the, better. Yeah. CrossFit got, 
their, they got their mobility fix on and he's already done his job. Now there's a million other people doing the same exact thing. There's no reason for him to stay there. It's time to grow and mm-hmm. move on to the next thing. So if I talk to him, it's just, it's like, what's he working on now? Uh, okay. uh-huh. Yeah, it's cool. Interesting. That well, very- let's change directions a little bit and talk about uh, your podcast, uh, Barbell Shrugged. Yep. What was the, uh, why'd you start it? What made you start that? And what was your passion behind that? Um, I, I always wanted to do radio when I was a kid. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I would listen to radio. What was your favorite shows? <laughs> Please say it's Howard Stern. Oh, oh my right God. <laughs> I don't, um, just everything that was on. <laughs> um, I, I, I did things like watch C-SPAN as a kid, too. I was weird. Oh, oh wow. shit. Oh, wow. So did I. You sound like my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I just listened to whatever AM radio was on. My dad played a lot of AM radio at work, um, and I worked with him. And then... Um, and then I just liked the radio DJs that played music, too. I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever. I never pursued it at all. Mm. Um, and I was listening to Rob Wolf's podcast for a while. And I was like, oh, this, is, this seems cool. It's a cool channel, like, whatever. And then um, I thought about podcasting. I didn't do it. And then it was recommended that I listen to Joe Rogan. And when I listened to Joe Rogan, it hit me. I go, oh, you can make a podcast wherever the fuck you want. Yeah, you, you say whatever <laughs> you want. That's like, the best part. I was like, <laughs> I can do that. Because up to that point, I was listening to Rob Wolf's, and Rob yeah. was like super content rich. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah, it was just yeah, like yeah. super nerdy. Very academic. I, I, I was and... like, I was like I, that doesn't look like fun at all. But right. <laughs> once I, but I love listening to it. Of course. And then uh, when I heard the Joe Rogan podcast, I was like, oh, okay. I could do it's this. It's on. So I just went out <laughs> and bought like, a bunch of equipment. He had that same effect on us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was just like a no. And I, I recognize, I look at the... I owned a CrossFit gym at the time, and I looked at the CrossFit market. And I was just like, nobody's actually talking about strength and conditioning, you know. And you know, they they've all got all these little niches, and and there's only a couple podcasts that the CrossFit market even listened to at that time. That's right. And I was just like, it was Rob Wolf and maybe one other that people mm-hmm. would listen to that were in our market. And I was like, man, there's this huge gap. Like, let's just go out there and start talking about strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. You know, talking about CrossFit from a strength and conditioning perspective. And sure enough. Well, that's smart because that that community is, we've talked about this all the time with CrossFit and their marketing and their community. It's brilliant. And it's like you get in that market and they just adopt it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you get, if there's definitely a a tipping point that you can just watch happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Once enough CrossFit has adopted one thing, it's a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it's still fairly small. Oh, geez. Yes. Drink number right. two. Where's mine, Doug? Yeah, what's up, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> like antsy pantsy over here. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, I, I lost track of where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, yeah, about uh, about their podcast and about how the community adopts it. And Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can just watch the tipping points happen. And I think it's because the CrossFit niche overall is fairly small compared mm-hmm. to the rest of the fitness mm-hmm. world. You know, the fitness industry is fucking Massive. ginormous. And I think a lot of people that work in CrossFit think that CrossFit's big. And, yeah. then, and I'm like, what are you guys fucking talking about? Like, yeah. like there's way dude, more. Dude, it wasn't even that long ago when I was watching them in parking lots, dude. Uh, like yeah. events in like parking lots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they've they've grown tremendously <laughs> well, since the, then. But the, still, the fitness the, industry. Well, the so big, big signing with Reebok was the huge, like, the yeah, major. I think yeah, that helped. The, the, I think it was just on its way up anyway. Well, like, yeah, no, it was already. And it's transformed the market. Like, oh. nobody... I, I, Nobody was deadlifting I, and squatting before CrossFit. We right. talked about this. I wonder, I wonder if like the functional bodybuilding thing would have ended up being a thing had CrossFit not come around. Mm. Mm. You know, just there's so many little things like that. Just to I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Because CrossFit made the functional fitness. Yeah. You can, we could argue over what parts of it are functional and which ones aren't. Mm. But you could you say that they made functional <laughs> fitness. Yeah. They made functional fitness a common thing in the fitness industry, yeah. whereas it was not a conversation for the, I, it sort I know, of made a spectrum I, now. I so know the guys that were doing functional fitness before CrossFit. Yeah. yeah. Nobody heard them talking except well, for like the nerds. And there's right, few yeah. and there's few things in the fitness industry uh as polarizing. Like CrossFit is extremely oh, yeah. extremely polarizing. I mean there's things we've talked about in the past that we as now we've come from the corporate we talked about this earlier the corporate fitness world, right? We managed big box gyms for 24 hour fitness and you know i grand opened a few of them and very very different I, when i looked at crossfit and i was a trainer for a long time and so so were adam and justin and when we looked at crossfit we saw it as this this business and i had witnessed other businesses 
explode in, in a similar way. Um, they didn't have staying power. CrossFit seems to have staying power, but like curves, for example, remember remember when right, curves right. exploded out of. I, I remember and, people saying that about CrossFit, like, oh, it's just a trend. <laughs> I was like, I was like, it's not a trend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, but it's it, it'll peak and then it'll teeter off for a well, while, the, but the, it'll, it'll, it'll stay. Well, I'll tell you the thing that I saw, because I, uh, I have a really good friend who owned a CrossFit gym, and I have a very respected trainer. He's very, very good at what he does. And I've seen his programming and seen how he, he runs his facility and does a great job. And I've seen other CrossFit gyms, and I see people out there doing their, you know, their wad, and they're doing Olympic lifts, and it's just, I'm looking at them like, who, who is teaching these people? How are these people possibly doing this? And as a business owner, I saw this discrepancy between one to another, and I understand that's that was kind of how the model was almost designed, right? To allow the, the best to, to succeed and the right, worst will fail. Right. But I saw that and I was like, okay, this is going to cause this can cause some big problems, and it even caused a lot of problems in our industry when when we would see stuff like that and be like, oh my god, did you see that? You know, people doing cleans out there in a circuit and they're throwing the weight everywhere and what's going on? I mean, I'm sure you guys must have been heard that like crazy as you guys were coming up. Oh yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was it was. The most common thing, I just kind of like shrug my shoulders and move on. Mm-hmm. But there's like, well, especially guys, when you're a guy like you, because you you have like an you Olympic said, lifting you, background, and you see that. To me, I, I like we, we oh, have a similar well, business mind. You see, like, oh my I god, was super, I'm gonna mop up here. I was <laughs> I was super critical in the beginning. Yeah, like yeah. I. I don't know. I'm, I'm just a more positive person overall now, but like, <laughs> like it's the weed, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, it definitely helps. It definitely helps. Yeah. <laughs> Justin will give you a shoulder massage later. Yeah, yeah, bro. Chill I got you. Out. I got you. Well, chill that, you out. That'll be a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but so, you know, when you, when you saw that coming from your background and you saw people like that, you're like, cool, I'm just going to do my thing and just. Well, how much awesome. did you push back at first? I mean, how much were you? Um, you know, I, I would, I would even go as far as to say I would got angry when I saw people not doing it well. And then I think that subsided once I realized how bad of a coach I was in the beginning. Hmm. Hmm. Like there was a point. You were really like self-reflective, like going through that, like more so than like super critical of like all these other people. Like, how can I change this? It's not going to change within to influence them. It took me a while to get yeah. there. Yeah. That's pretty, I mean, that's <laughs> it was, pretty... It wasn't like I was always yeah. like that. That would be super fucking cool if I was you know, that aware. <laughs> Coming in like, I'm like, wow, dude. Yeah, that's that's powerful. Yeah. But, and, uh, it, you know, it. I, I would say the gap in which I do something and the gap and, and the point in which I'm able to observe it as a third party has sure. gotten very short. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, What's helped that? How did, uh, besides what? age and just... Overall wisdom and well, running, I, running into brick walls enough times, you go, "Hey, you know what? It probably would be better if I climbed." Well, you know, yeah, some- I used to be a brick wall runner for sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, sometimes, to, uh, sometimes there's yeah. a, there's a moment. You know, sometimes there's not one moment, but there's like a, where you can remember and be like, "Oh, I remember." Okay, oh, that, that was, totally there was a moment. <laughs> I had a bag of mushrooms. <laughs> oh, that, that'll do <laughs> it. Here we go. Yeah, well, that, that was it. Wow. I, I I um. What happened? How old, how old were you actually? Yeah, describe this. How, yeah, how old were you? <laughs> Experience. I was. <laughs> It was four years ago. Oh, okay. Holy wow. shit. Oh, wow. Not that yeah, long ago. Awesome. Not that long ago. Um, I, I was always interested in, in being that, mm-hmm. but I wasn't accessing it. Oh. And then I uh, went to a conference and where we did some empathy exercises. It was a marketing conference. And Now, uh, you at this point, are you like, cool, empathy exercises, or are you like, are you fucking kidding me, empathy exercises? Are you fucking kidding me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, you one. that one, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, what the thing is, is, I prided myself on being good at things, like, and still do. And I'm good at business. And I go to this business conference, and there's this one piece. There's a seven day conference. There's one afternoon that I was not good at. And it was the empathy piece. You know, I was like, oh, come on, please. But then I was like, I recognize I'm not good at this. Anyways, so a week goes by, and I realize. I remember Tim Ferriss saying something about eating mushrooms and helping him on Joe Rogan's podcast <laughs> no about, about like, oh yeah, you know, sometimes solve problems there. I'm like, I think I've got a problem to solve. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Eat some mushrooms. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but it, that was... Fast forward, it worked. That was, yeah, I mean, that was, um, I, I did it right. I did it with a good intention and, and, uh, and... Did you take a heroic dose? It was. A, I didn't know I was, but yeah. I, mean, oh, it, no. I, I wouldn't say oh, wow. it was an ultra heroic dose, but it was more than most people like to take. Oh shit! So probably around three grams. So you were you were you were gone, gone. Not gone, gone, but you were. Yeah, I, I traveled. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I really, I the entire universe collapsed inside of me. Holy shit! So I had now, I had some ego dissolution. Now, were you scared while this was happening? Was this some, okay? So let me ask you this, because I've talked to lots of people who've had transformative experiences like this some through meditation, most through psychedelics. 
what, when you're in this moment, is this, I hear one or two stories from people, either while it's happening, I'm growing, or it was terrifying and the growth happened after. I've experienced both. Okay. Uh, that particular day was, I think I was in such awe, and I'm a bit of a thrill seeker. So this is the other thing that I've found with people and who do these things regularly is the people who are thrill seekers can get deeper because they're not afraid. They, they can get deeper mm-hmm. quicker. Well, the the fear is exhilarating. So I find I personally am a bit of a thrill seeker. So it's not. So I I recognize in the moment that it's growth, and yet it's still terrifying. And so you weren't afraid to let go, basically. Yeah, it, I, I I think I I learned the let go lesson before that. Most people that I witness with their first time. Letting go is the first lesson mm. that has to be learned. That's true. Yeah. And, uh, and, but for me, I'd, I'd, I think I learned that lesson when I was in the Navy. So, um, so you, were, you were primed. <clears throat> yeah. So you go in there, you eat this bag of shrooms. You're like, I suck at empathy. My intention is I'm going to eat these shrooms and I'm going to learn I wasn't even empathy. thinking about that. that. That was what was on my mind. But I went in there. I was like, I'm going to – I've got like – I brought my boat business notebook. <laughs> you can solve an actual problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To the park. That's two plus you, two. This, oh, that be me. this is how little I knew about what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. I did choose the right music, though. I, I found um, an artist I had seen at the conference, did some album art for this album, and I was like, oh, I'll just listen to that. It happened to be a very psychedelic album, so it was perfect. Ran- oh. Random Rab, and, uh, who I've watched at... Burning Man several times now. Oh Very shit! Cool. I can't wait to get into that. Uh, well, we yeah. will. So you're you're in this. You, you oh, eat yeah. the shrooms. You go in there, and what, what happens? Thinking? So I'm laying on my back in the park, and I'm just having the best time ever. And now are you seeing shit at this point, or are you just feeling like fucking awesome? I'm feeling amazing, and I close my eyes, and I'm laying there. And I've just got like tears running down my face. What? I'm just so happy. Oh wow! <laughs> and and tears I, of joy. And I'm laying on my blanket, and I'm staring, and and I'm got my eyes closed, and I open my eyes, and I see the entire sky, and when I see, look at the sky, it completely goes fractal. It's just Whoa. so it's like yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. I was. And it is that when everything goes away? It falls. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it falls. The entire world falls inside of me, and so I realized that the everything that I am perceiving outside of me is within me. And I, I was just, I had this very deep realization. My world is my responsibility to create. Holy shit. And so um, that was a cool realization. That was worth crying and tears of joy over. And I just had a great time for like half an hour for that. And then these people, people are getting, I'm a <laughs> mistake number two. I'm at a dog park <laughs> And, uh, oh, <laughs> wait a minute! Wait a minute! You wait! <laughs> you wait a psychedelic! And you wait a psychedelic a dose of mushrooms? And you say you're gonna walk your dog? You're gonna walk your dog at the same okay. time or something? Or what, no, you, how, no, how do you just imagine! It? Imagine you being high it? as fuck and dogs oh. coming around you and oh shit. My God. That could be Panic horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them Cujo or what? <laughs> Not a lot of thought process went into this. <laughs> you got your, it's like I got your notebook. I got my, I got my bag of mushrooms. I like dogs. <laughs> we'll man. figure out the rest later. <laughs> Welcome to my life. I, <laughs> was it? Uh, my my business partner says uh, I my order is ready, fire, aim. So, <laughs> yes, I like that. Uh, but uh, so I'm watching. No, it's a big dog park. It's got like three lakes. It's it's not like a dog park you have in LA. Oh, okay. or there's a small cage. So uh, we go. Uh, so I'm hanging out on top of this hill, and all these people are getting off work, and they're bringing their dogs to the dog park, and they're fiddling with their phones, they're texting, they're on phone calls, and they're playing with their dogs. And I can tell that the dog. I can read the body language of the dog right now, and the dogs are frustrated. They're their owners aren't giving them their full attention. Oh, shit. And the dogs are like, fuck you. I've been in a cage or I've been in the backyard for eight hours, nine hours, ten hours. You come home and you're texting while you're playing with me. I can tell that the dogs can tell. <laughs> 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 and I'm, on, trip I'm so. on top of this. Hey, dog. Yes, yeah, so this reminds me, right? Hey, dog. <laughs> you see the size of that chicken? <laughs> 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 oh, oh, oh. oh shit! A little movie trivia for you right there. Uh, what is that from? That's Young Guns. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I Take that. peyote, right? Not the peyote. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm up there getting angry at these owner. I'm like, what the fuck? Pay attention to your dog. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, it hits me. I go, I do the same shit to my dog. Oh, I see. And then I go, oh, I do the same thing to my wife. I do the same thing to my mom. I do the same thing to my clients. I never give them my full attention. I was like, oh, shit. 
<laughs> so I wrap up the journey. I go home. In fact, at this point, my wife and I were <laughs> on the verge of, uh, we, we were probably, yeah, we were on the path of getting divorced. Oh, wow. For sure. And I got home and I decided to give her my full attention and just ask her how her day was. And about 30 seconds into this interaction, she just starts crying. Holy shit. And the reason she started crying is because it was the first time I had actually listened to her. Shit. And we'd been married for years at this point, and I hadn't been listening. She, I don't think she... Crazy that she felt it that quick, yeah. right? Yeah. You I made that change, and then instantly, like... Yeah. I don't think that she'd ever been listened to. <clears throat> wow. And so the, so she didn't even know what she wasn't, she didn't know what she didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I gave her my full, what she could feel was the fact that I gave her my full attention. Mm -hmm. When someone it was actually new. engages and gives you their full attention for a long period of time, you can feel that. That's, Absolutely. A, that's different. Most people don't get to experience that. Well, especially now. Yeah. I trip out on, that's what trips me out is, this is something we're talking in our mid, late thirties that we're talking about this like, putting these connecting these dots dude how hard is it going to be for this generation that's fucking coming up oh right? i know i mean I don't, how, I don't know, the, maybe, how get, the fuck are you the maybe they'll maybe they'll eat face to face interactions i i think it's gonna go um i think that there's gonna be a split and so like real extreme extreme or yeah. i feel like you're in my brain yeah, yeah there's gonna be a split and and the reason there's gonna be a split is it's already happening so there are those of us that use iphones and computers to as a tool to leverage to to make the world a better place. And then there are people who are just pure consumers. Mm -hmm. And the, these people already exist. They, they have a big screen in their living room, and every time they get home, they just sit and watch TV. Uh, they constantly check social media to see if someone liked the picture, um, or, you know, whatever. And so there are people who are just pure consumers, and there are people who, are, who, are, who see it as a tool. They have that, ob that, they have that objective... The objectivity about themselves as a tool, like this body, and then they, if you can see that, then you can actually see that the phone and the computer are just simply tools for interacting and connecting with others. But, so I think that there's going to be uh, a bit of, there's going to be like almost like a plugged in type of scenario where people are going to put on virtual reality and there's just going to be leader, tribe leaders in there. And I think there's just going to be tribes that form that aren't going to be geographically confined and yeah, I think some people are going to be putting stuff out and building their own little no, cultures. I, think, you know, I remember it's the be first, very interesting. I remember the first time that I realized that, and we were all over. We were at, we were at my uh, my girl's family's place, right? And it was like everyone's drinking and eating, having a good time, and all the families kind of socialized up. Real great, great time with family, right? And yeah. I'm just and I'm just sitting there, kind of soaking it up and observing everything. And the two younger ones, uh, my niece and nephew, who are like in their early twenties. You know, we're like taking pictures and Snapchat and bullshit, whatever like that. Yeah. And uh, I, I saw one of them run over and was so concerned about what she looked like in the picture that he snapped across the room and was like threatening, like to throw his phone away if he posted it on his. Oh shit! Like that it was that like here we are with all this family and all yeah. this love and all this this connections happening, this and that. And at that moment, I realized that in like how much that has consumed them, that they're not even really participating in what everything else was going around them, that they were so consumed by that and concerned yeah. about getting liked in this virtual world that doesn't even really well, fucking matter. Well, really it's exists. typical, well, right? Well, it does matter. I don't know. I mean, it just amplifies, right? So if, they're, if you're... It, like, if we're in a situation and someone doesn't like somebody in the room, then people can, like, l play it off. But in an electronic environment or technological environment, everything's amplified. Hmm. Yeah. So it's easier for people to tell people they don't like each other or whatever. Well, right? there's and also so, like, uh, uh, being anonymous with that. Well, I mean, the problem is, with, is identifying with that. It's okay to have it and to see all that, right? But yeah, you identify with well, that. The same, thing, the same thing happens in the world we're sitting in now. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's it, like... It's just it, bigger. It, it's just... It, it's the same thing, but it's easier to see... Because it's amplified. Yeah, I think... It's I the think same behavior. It's typical, right? Typical of humans. We take a tool that's very powerful, and you see it go can go in two different directions. It's like any powerful tool that mankind has developed. The internet and social media and technology can be, and are, and have been shown to be incredible tools of connection, actually making people more connect. I mean... Social media, you in reality, you can connect with people that you haven't seen, you know, family members you would never talk to. If emergencies happen, people can find each other. Ideas can spread. But at the same time, you can also use this tool to disconnect in ways that are more powerful than we ever have before. You can 
disappear into it. You could, you know, worry about what, you know, 4,000, you know, followers th- think about you instead of the, you know, your wife or your, your brother, or your sister, or your, your boyfriend or girlfriend. So it's just these very, very powerful tools that can be utilized in different ways. Like anything mankind creates, it goes in both directions. But I wanted to ask you about with your experience with your mushrooms and you come home and you're talking to your wife and you pay attention to her for the first time in, in years and she cries. Did you at that moment find empathy for yourself for having done that for that long, for, for having not paying attention? Or did you beat yourself up over it? Uh, I, I had empathy for myself for in that, in that case. Um, I've never actually considered it. Um, I, I never identified that as having happened and I didn't beat myself up over, over it. Um, I mean, that's been a continual lesson over time is I normally, when I realize I don't beat myself up for the things that I have deep realizations over and like, oh, okay, I have you compassion for myself because I just didn't know any better. I think I, I think I used to not have compassion for myself and I, and I still struggle with it here and there when it takes me a long time to learn something when I see how I could have learned it the first time. So one of the things I've been working on is increasing my sensitivity and that, so the more sensitive I am, the more I can, I, it's like a, the louder the canary in the coal mine can be for me. And so what ends up happening is less time goes by before I make the correction. And every once in a while I recognize I'm just blown away at how long it took me (laughs) to have. And that's usually what I get upset about myself over is the rate at which I grow. Mm, you want to grow faster yeah and i and recently i've become much more compassionate and kind to myself in that regard as well because that's that's actually a piece of the growth is having that that compassion for self the irony is the people who are most uh concerned about the speed at which they grow tend to be fast growers and also don't realize that their concern over the speed of their growth is impeding exactly their growth i think so it's a very interesting conundrum well, it's the, it's the love your ideas, but don't marry them, right? It's like have a passion for, have a passion for things, see that, but then also don't be, be uh, have that ability to detach yourself and have perspective. Yeah. Like that's... I, I just had a conversation with my friend, Daniel Schmackenberger, about this recently. Um, and we were talking about the way the conversation ended up going was being versus becoming. And we live in a Western culture where becoming is the predominant thing. And that We hold that as the more important thing is who am I becoming, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. All future, and then, yeah, based. And then, and then, you know, the people who are like, man, I'm just happy being, and we call those hippies. Spicoli. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, hey, man. And the key is, is we see these things as competing um, ideals of, of being. They don't and, have to be. And they, and they don't have to be. And you don't want to meet in the middle, because I've tried that, mm. and it didn't work, not real well. And that, what I end up doing is just kind of swinging real hard from one side to the, the next. So, oh, the old pendulum swing. Yeah, the old pendulum swing. So now is can you see what is what is it that 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 flow that is seeing your present person as perfection and simultaneously seeing a vision of yourself in the future that's different and being able to hold both of those simultaneously is if you can do that, I think yeah, the rate of growth can be phenomenal. So mm. you're, uh, I mean, we, we've been talking now for, you know, a couple hours off air and now, you know, on the show and you're obviously a driven individual. You're very successful. And I found that uh, people in that situation, when they have, the, one of the reasons why they have trouble being, like you're saying, is because they feel like being means you're content and you're settling. Like, oh, okay, I'm happy. I don't need to grow anymore or I want to grow. So I, I don't want to be what I'm at now. Mm-hmm. I want to be over here. And that's why they become competitive with each other. That's why they can't coexist in that person's mind. Uh-huh. Is that was 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 that the case for you, or did you find a different way to? Yeah, I I, I found that when I was trying to be, be on the being side more, it, I was less effective. Mm. I didn't push as hard, and then I would. It was like I was going through seasons or phases where I was bouncing between the two, and I think I bounced between the two long enough to get a big picture of what that looks like, and then. I think it was necessary to bounce between the two. Hmm. I don't think there was... I, I guess I had to do that. I can't speak for anyone but my own experience. But yeah, I, I think I had to go through that phase where I got frustrated with being too far on either side before being able to reconcile them as a whole. How did you do that? How do you reconcile them now? Oh, um, you, have to, you have to go to the fifth dimension. 
<laughs> take us, file them. Take us to the fifth dimension, bro. <laughs> Please take us to the fifth dimension. <laughs> no, no, not really. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a there's a really good YouTube video. Oh fuck, what's it called? Uh, it's a uh, if you just YouTube two uh, D versus three D mm. um, cartoon and. Uh, basically what it talks about is we're viewing the world from a two-dimensional perspective a lot of times, and that is, you know, if there's a cylinder passing through a two-dimensional world... It just looks like a, di- it looks just like a, it can, like a dot, right? It would, if you cut it one way, it looks like a rectangle. If you cut it another way, it looks like a circle. And so you could have two different two-dimensional beings seeing the same exact item and one calling it a, a, a rectangle and one calling it a circle. Do you know what I'm saying? I do Are know you what you're saying. Me? There's, there's, a, there's another video that's very similar where it has like this two-dimensional creature and when a three-dimensional creature moves through it, they just see these, they just see it completely different because they can't even perceive it and they can't imagine it because they live in a yeah. 2D world. And it's an, it's an example of paradox and that is being able to just hold two things that seem opposite but they're not and, and hold them both oh, as completely Oh, fuck, you just true. blew my mind right now. That's cool. So, um, anytime I, I, consider being able to hold paradoxes is, is, and, and and you can hold, there's so many different things to hold that in there's not just one paradox <laughs> there it, it's almost infinite and if you can get in the habit of being chasing that you know yeah there's there's yeah you got to be in a state of mind it's b- being in a state of mind where you can hold both is what it is it's not i don't think there's like an a way i can even explain it or or anything like that there it i got there through Lots of meditation and some plant medicine. So, what are the plant medicine? Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like an intervention. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> actually, it's not. Actually, no. I, yeah. On that, just, no. On that note, actually, you're, I know you're. Are, did you finish stealing fire? Or are you going through it right now? I'm halfway through it right okay, now. Okay, so, started listening to it on the way here. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're you're there yet or not. I, I know they get into the hedonic calendar, and I got to talk to Jamie Willer a little bit about this, and. What I told him is I, I, the more people that I um, interacted with that had these psychedelic experiences, you know, I feel like a lot of them, it, I mean, almost all of them, it's mind altering, life changing, that gives them this whole new perspective on life. But then th- I would say there's a 50 50 of the, a group of them, at least half of them, uh, are chasing that all the time. Yep. That where they, where they almost lose perspective on on themselves not grounded yeah right not but they but they act like they're overly grounded in comparison to the rest of the world because they're chasing these experiences that nobody else can have and the hedonic calendar you, you'll see when you get into stealing fire at the end he talks about they actually have become their tribe they've created a calendar to help people so that that doesn't happen now did you ever struggle with that or battle that like after you had that experience like how do you not want to fucking next weekend i'm running that back again i want to know more no i i i intuitively did the right thing um yeah, I look back on it, and I've shared this with people who have much more experience than I do in, in these things, and they're sometimes, well, I'll say they're, they're usually impressed with the level of intuition I practice with it, whereas a lot of people want to do it all the time after that. I took, after my first major experience, I think it was three months before I did it again. Um, there's a process that you want to go through after having a major psychedelic event called integration, where you... Make, you create positive frames around the experience you just had, and then you figure out how it applies to as many aspects of your life as possible. Yeah, and then you got to live them. And you intentionally make the changes. And so the first time I had that experience, it took me months to feel like I had a full harvest. Hmm. I think that people who end up overdoing it, they put too much importance on the medicine and not enough responsibility on themselves for the change that's happening. And so I can hear it in people's language a so lot of times. I, that's, what I, that's what gives sure. it away to me. When you start, I hear the Mother Earth talk a lot. And like when you, when you start hearing She them, shows me. And, yeah, that uh, you start hearing this very religious. And it was, I grew up in a home that was like hardcore religious. Yeah. So I remember. Yeah, yeah. remember and I, we There's went a lot to, of similarities. And so yeah. that's what immediately we kind of draw back. And we uh-huh. are very skeptical of the process. <sighs> yeah, there's, there's phases that people go through a lot of times. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, for me personally, I like to take responsibility for my own experience. And I like to think of, uh, the plants and things like that as tools. And if I get the message, I, I may reference source. Um, but I'm not, 
I'm not dogmatic I don't, I don't, about it. Yeah, I don't praise the plants too much. This is, <laughs> you know, I, I say they allow me to have access to something else for sure. And everything's connected. And everything's one system. And, and it's interesting. But so I think focusing on a plant and giving it all the praise is, is kind of strange. Yeah. You when know, you should just be like praising this experience. Right. This is, this is what's fucking crazy. Right. <laughs> this is what we're having right now. Well, you, ta- you talked about it all being inside your head. I mean, that's fucking true. Yeah. You're not, you're not seeing shit. I mean, no. you're not really seeing it. This is all created no, yeah, inside your mind. Until, you're, until your senses take it in and create a story for you, it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think we live in the Matrix. These for guys sure. hate it when I say Yeah, oh, man. Are for you, sure. Are you with me on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's a probability, a high probability God that, that uh, we're in simulation right now. Yeah, that's one hundred percent what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you if you if you factor in the age of the university, fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He agrees with me. Yeah, but what robot is dreaming about me right now? Uh-huh. You know what I mean? That's bullshit. Some hot one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. Why are, why are robots dreaming about us? <laughs> are your are, you, are your partners? Uh, how like minded are all you guys? And what what uh, where, what are your strengths or differences? We talked a little bit about that. Like you know, you guys all have your different roles. If you were to kind of like in a nutshell explain your partners and explain oh, yourself, <laughs> how how would you describe describe them? Um, so. I'm the loud mouth. No, I, I, I'm like a very outside the company type of person. I like doing what we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Outside facing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like taking care of a lot of that. Um, my partner, Doug, he actually helps. Um, he helps. He helped me for a long time uh, make sure that what I was doing wasn't. I have to really sell him on ideas. And he's really caused me to become very clear about how I communicate the vision. Mm-hmm. And so um, he really supports me in that and making sure it happens. Um, he's really good with inside the company and making sure that everybody's getting along. He, he's the harmony. So I'm like loud and want the truth. He And I'll destroy everything to get it. And he keeps the wheels on the bus long enough to get there. <laughs> and so, um, and then he's also very systems oriented. And he likes to be able to build things one time and have them run and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I have another partner, Rob. He is kind of like our, our chief business officer. Mm-hmm. So he check, he takes care of everything in the background. He makes sure, you know, taxes are paid and accounting is done. You know, all the stuff that I don't even want to think about. <laughs> and so he, he manages all that and he's very happy doing it. Um, everyone's very happy in their roles. And then I have two other... Uh, partners. One is Marcus. Um, he is just a sales machine, and he's a he's a good pitch man too. So I like if we're doing anything business development wise, I like to include him in anything. I'll I'll get the feeling about something, and then he'll be able to like really like dial it in and, and figure out if it's in brand alignment. He's also huge on customer experience. He's super dialed into. Um, thinking about what the person even desires before they even up, end up on our website or hear the show. It's like if they see an ad, what's that experience? Like all the way to maybe they're not even a customer anymore three years later. What's their, what's, what are they feeling about us now? Yeah. So he's, Have you guys been together as partners from the beginning till so now? So me and the first two guys have been – so me and my business partner, Rob, who's our, our chief business officer, we opened the gym in 07 together. Then Doug came in and um, – uh, last year, or a year after that, so in 2009, and then um, and then we've teamed up with Marcus, and that's the guy that's just like just customer experience, mm-hmm. sales, um, and then another guy, JD, in the last two years, and JD is he has built a lot of our uh, basically all the technology side of things, mm-hmm. and then he's also been instrumental in making uh, our new business coaching for gym owners possible. So um, he's really dry. Like JD has stepped in, in the last two years and really um, driven a lot of things. He's a decade older than the rest of us, and so he has more experience. And so, does he like it when you say that? A decade older? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he listens to a fucking word I say. Anybody's podcast. I, 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 the old silverhead. Huh? He, he's too bu- he's too busy making the machine work. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. but, how many? And, and we get along really well. How many legs? 
do, does this com- business have? What do you guys? Because you have the podcast, which we're familiar with, and that's how we knew about you. Yeah, you just mentioned uh, business coaching tools. Um, uh, you got the software we talked about. You, you've got you've got yeah. Uh, what are what are we're all the legs of your of your business? Uh, so we have training programs and coaching programs for athletes. Uh, we have some digital information products, educational products, uh, just for anyone who wants to learn anything about anything um, fitness related. Not everything, but. Um, that was kind of like the beginning and we still, that still happens. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, over time we put a lot more emphasis on helping gym owners specifically because Mm -hmm. we look at the CrossFit market and we see where things could be done a lot better. Mm -hmm. And I think we can make the biggest impact possible if we create an environment where the gym owner can succeed and the coaches can focus on coaching and actually Mm -hmm. getting good at that. Because right now everyone's spread too fucking thin. Yeah. Do what you're good at. Yeah. Just coaching. And so we are building what we're building is we want to make the gym owner's life super easy and profitable. And we know if we do that, then we'll transform the market. And so uh, we're putting a lot of focus over there. So we have the inbound marketing automation software. So if a gym owner gets that, they get a website and all, and all the marketing stuff they need. And then we're launching our business coaching. So uh, if somebody uh, is opening a gym or they already have a gym open, then you know we have a system with coaching that gets them to be a profitable gym. And uh, and we build it around their own culture and stuff like that. That's what's cool about our business coaching. It's not a one-size-fits-all. We're, we've really built it very principle-based so we can help out um, people in the way that's going to be meaningful for them. And without, I, I've seen so many business programs that would just rip the soul out of a business um, in order to like install a bunch of systems. And fitness what a lot of people don't realize, we experienced this with one of the large organizations we worked with where they went through a transition where they had a bunch of bean counters come in. It's kind of like what happened in the American auto industry where the passion, the soul was ripped out and it was all about these I numbers. Love the, I love the bean counters. They just can't make all the decisions. That's right. And exactly. And, but that's what happened. Yeah. And it decimated or, or destroyed, um, you know, something that we had, you know, grown, grown with and a, people, a lot of people don't realize that fitness is it's different than none of the businesses right I mean when people come in and buy a membership to your gym what are they buying well if it's a CrossFit box they're buying they're actually buying coaching and they don't even but you don't leave with like you don't hold coaching in your hand no, you know I mean? you're not leaving no. with a product right it's, it's service based it's a service based business and so I mean it's the same thing it's the same challenges as someone as a hairstylist would have you know you just leave with a fucking haircut. <laughs> you actually, you know, that's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah. This way you either leave with losing 15 pounds or break your back or something. That's, For sure. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. The other. Oh, no, but it, but it is a different industry. It's not like getting your haircut because your hair does just grow back. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not your neck. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and people are, it, it's a, it's a really vulnerable thing working with a coach and really going after if someone's actually going after their goals and working with a coach, it can be a very vulnerable experience. And that is one thing that makes it much different. And anyone who's been a personal trainer before knows that they end up practically being a therapist as well. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, and it's a special time. It really is. You need to be like, you need to be ready to help. I mean, I don't know if you need to do anything, but you know, I think it's good if a coach does have the capacity to hold that space for a client to work through issues that is actually related to them being able to reach their goals that may not look like it's connected mm-hmm. when it really is. Oh, someone comes in and says, I need to lose 30 pounds. I've been overweight for, you know, 20 years. Uh, it's not 20 pounds or 15 pounds you need to lose. It's all kinds of emotional yeah. and, yeah. you know, crazy stuff. And you learn this as a trainer the first month you're a personal trainer. When, when you look back, because we do this a lot on our show, we talk about, um, you know, paradigm shattering moments for us as, as trainers, how we evolved and like going back going, oh my God, I remember I used to yeah, teach people this. Or say this. Yeah. Oh, do you, yeah, do, you, do you remember <laughs> moments like that? Like, We've admitted remember? a lot of shit and it's been hard. <laughs> You know what? Would you, like, what ah. are some of those those moments that you that you remember where that really changed you as you know who you were as a fit? I mean, the fact that you even talk that you spoke that quick to uh, the psychology of a client because anybody I feel that's been doing this for a long time that's really successful and good at realizes that that's like everything really. Yeah, know? I mean, and all the other things are like <sighs> minor details. I think it was just a running joke. I, I don't remember. I don't remember when I had the first bit. <sighs> 
I always knew there was like a therapy side of it, but I never took it serious. I didn't take it seriously for a long time. And then um, because I came from a school of thought that it was just work harder. Yeah. Don't be a little bitch. Right. And that's how I coached. And Oh, <laughs> that's it. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Same and, path. And, um, and I think having the mushroom experience actually changed all that. So that, that actually helped me actually connect with my clients wow. at that point. So that... Did oh you did you tell your clients by the way when you got to them were you like hey I eat mushrooms and no. I'm gonna train you different now? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot like Super Mario Brothers. Oh, yeah. shit. Now I can shoot fire. Oh, by the way. <laughs> no, I just started. You know, did they notice? It, it was they like, like what's going I, on? Here? I just I, I started. Hey, gro- everybody! I, I, I ate some mushrooms. Though. I ground it out and ground up a bunch of mushrooms and put it in their pre workout. <laughs> <laughs> I did not do that. This is the most transformative <laughs> workout. <laughs> <laughs> Go to a dog park. I'm having so much fun. We're out for three hours. <laughs> oh shit! No, I do recognize. I mean, I definitely became much more patient and began began listening and just being more compassionate and empathetic. At that point, um, it was not until I hired myself a business coach that I that I connected all the dots. And I probably haven't connected all the dots yet, anyway. But that was the next level of understanding in regard to what coaching was, was working with a business coach and seeing the power of him just planting some seeds here and there and asking really good questions that I developed as a, as a human being. And I recognized that so much of the work I did with him and then just some, some other work I did that had nothing to do with physical training made me a much more capable athlete. And, uh, and once I discovered those things, I realized that we've really relegated uh, the uh, coaching to to three buckets, especially in the CrossFit space. I don't know if this is – I mean, this is definitely amongst most personal trainers. We go movement, program design, and nutrition. And if you want to be a better coach, you got to learn more about one of those three things. And I've come to find out that nobody's teaching coaching. And so the the there's so many techniques and methods – to get people to realize for themselves uh, what is actually holding them back from reaching their goals. There's so many cool techniques out there and um, that don't involve mushrooms. And, <laughs> and I've, after I had that experience and then just, I've had so many experiences where now if I work with an athlete, the program design piece is such a fucking small part of it. It used to That's dominate, part. that used to dominate my, my coaching bandwidth was how can I build the perfect program that's going to get this person to whatever, let's get their nutrition dialed in. And then they, yeah. And then shit would happen. And then now I realize like, if I work with an athlete now, it's like, "Mm, yeah, make sure you're doing that shit. Right. Send me some videos. I want to see like you're moving really well. And, uh, and I'm, I'm only working with like two people. Mm -hmm. So, so much more effort on just like what's holding you back. Let's yeah. have a conversation. Right. All of a sudden, you start asking like character questions and, and asking and like behavioral if, type stuff. And if an athlete doesn't know that, then I'm not going to work with them. Yeah. Like if they're going to think that that's not important, they have to be ready for it. Because- they have to be ready for it. They have to like they have to be at that point themselves, which means there's hardly any. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I've had people, you know, where I'll tell them, you know, they'll tell me, tell me what to eat, tell me how to, you know, how many macro, you know, what my macro should be, what my yeah. calories should be, what my workout should look like. And uh, I'll ask them, well, you know, tell me what you're eating now. And then they'll tell me and I'll say, well, how does that make you feel? And you get either, ooh, that's awesome or fucking tell me what to do. Just right, tell me what to right, do. Right. Just write it down, man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, and there's a big difference between those people. Huge difference. <laughs> yeah. but, but I think as a trainer, you realize the only the ones that make the meaningful, long lasting changes are the ones that understand that how do you make how does that make you feel type questions and not the just tell me what to do. And they're gonna dig down and go, you know what? I'm gonna take a moment, take a breath, and actually pull that string. And so it. Mike, we go. Mike, if you have if you have uh, if you have this mentality, right? And I, I totally, I think very similar to us. What what's your thought or what goes through your head when you see like a a culture like IIFYM hit like social media by storm? Like what goes through your head when you see that? I feel like you're trying to be political right, <laughs> right now. Yeah, he's, don't be yeah, political. Yeah, come on, just let it out. <laughs> First <laughs> response. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The old you. The old you. Give me the twenty five year old you, bro. Give me the twenty five year old version. Don't get all deep on it. Ma- it yeah. makes me it makes me pretty mad and. 
Well, it has. It, it doesn't make me mad anymore um, because I realize that everyone's just doing the best they can do with what they're given right now. Mm. And um, and there was a time where I followed. No, no, there wasn't a time I followed that mentality. But like once I got, <laughs> you're like I was never that stupid. So you're <laughs> no, like, no, can no, you no. Say that. Bro? <laughs> I can see it in your but, face. <laughs> <laughs> but a food quality always mattered to me. Yeah, and, I and, see what you're saying. Yeah. And and so, but there was a time where yeah. I was so narrow-minded about a thing that I'm sure outsiders were looking at me and going, all right. And so, you know, I think it's good for me to say that I completely disagree with that philosophy so that people will listen. Uh, but I don't have, I don't want to like, like demo anybody for it because in five years they may be saying, hey, you know what? I've grown a lot since then and that's not the thing that I recommend now. And yeah, I was just being, you know, I didn't, I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. But I was... And maybe that helps somebody. Maybe it, if it fits your macros type thing, you know, somebody's tried everything and all of a sudden that's the one thing that clicked. So they do that for six months and eat a bunch of donuts and, and chicken breasts. And then uh, they go and, <laughs> and then, you know, they end up finding something that's a little bit more sustainable and healthy and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, for me personally, yeah. So, you know, I remember that I've given out some advice that was really immature at certain points. So this is what has, yeah. this is what gives you patience with the, the people out there that are prescribing it or sharing it. But I meant like the whole movement. It's okay for you to, I didn't know it was a movement. Yeah. Well, oh. it's like, it's how, how, how much are, do you get into like the whole like physique, bodybuilder aesthetic world? I mean, actually, uh, I don't think I really live in any kind of world. <laughs> like I, I, Damn. I don't. Hell yeah! <laughs> I don't. I don't really pay attention to what anyone's doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's why. Then. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why I know because I was in it. That's yeah. why. If I wasn't in it, I wouldn't be paying attention either. Yeah. I didn't realize how bit much of a problem it was until I got into the into the actual arena and, and yeah started, started competing. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I I think this complete disregard for you know artificial sweeteners and and this embrace of, of doing artificial sweeteners and saying, ah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm like, I think it, I think it might matter. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, we should probably well, pay let's attention wait to that. a little while. You know, let's there's a lot of stuff. This. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff coming out on gut health right now. And, and I've watched people do some gut health things where they couldn't lose this weight or they didn't have the physique they wanted or whatever. And all of a sudden they focused on better gut health and stopped worrying about counting how many carbs they got. And all of a sudden they got, just lean right out. Or you got I mean, they just uh, a study just came out that showed that Parkinson's linked to a particular bacteria in the gut, and they yeah. think that may be the cause of fucking Parkinson's disease. Damn it! Unfucking believable. And then we've talked yeah. about this before, but the studies on mice where they do the fecal transplants from the, the right. skinny right. mass to the, the skinny mouse to the fat mouse personality and everything. <laughs> they get yeah. fucking skinny from it, and you know. So there was a there was another article that came out just the other day that I was looking at that was suggesting that um we might it might be help it might help us be more youthful if we were to eat the fecal matter of younger humans. Wow. <laughs> it's all pause. It's all pause. It's one of those like you first Don't bro. throw away that baby dapper girl. <laughs> yeah, you you yeah. first bro. I'm, hey, right, I'm right hey. behind you. <laughs> Look at Doug. He's oh so God. fucking youthful. So, so, have you been eating our poop, Doug? <laughs> so there's a there's a few ways vampire. There's a few ways to consume poop. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, this is a clip. Right tell us. You can actually, Normally, you got to pay for this. By <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the, this the, just got X rated. The best healthy way to do it is just to straight up eat it. Now, no, no, uh, okay. if you're not if you're not quite ready for that, then you know you would encapsulate it and then swallow it. They and, do a whole cleaning process of you know, which uh, that confuses me. And then know, cleaning a, shit. How do you clean <laughs> shit? It's like cleaning not, dirt. Oh, right? okay. for this. Like, oh, that's clean dirt. No, that's clean <laughs> shit. Is that possible? It's like an oxymoron. Mm. Well, you run. You clean water by running it. How do you manage those well, burps? Why? <laughs> That's <laughs> what we want to know. But so like, and then uh, and then you can also do the uh, the fecal enema or not enema. It would be a fecal transplant. Transplant. Yeah. And so those are like the three ways to consume fecal <laughs> matter that would be beneficial. From what I understand, you would want to do both the transplant and probably take the pills if you want. You know, I just want to. I just want to. You, you got to come from both ends. We got to make sure we leave a <laughs> cautionary note here to the audience. 
Don't <laughs> yeah, eat to, someone's poop <laughs> and put someone's poop some on your butt. And say I'm, you're, I'm glad you said that. Say, yeah. I, make sure I forget very how dumb people are. Yeah, some like, people. Fuck it, I'm, I'm, mind I'm, pump I'm, said it. I'm gonna do yeah, it. I'm gonna, <laughs> I got my ribeye. I got my turd. We're gonna eat this together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, honey, did you finish in the bathroom? <laughs> Can you put that in a tube? I need to put it on my butt. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think you want to. Need an extra Tabasco or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Uh, oh, so, so, <laughs> so your view is considering your view on artificial su- su- uh, sweetener, excuse me, is, is pretty negative. Like you're opposed to them for the most part. Uh, you must be opposed to most protein powders, bars, those kinds of supplements, meal replacements. Um, yeah, I don't. <sighs> it depends. So uh, there are certain brands out there that, um, that they would meet the standard and most would not. Yeah, so I mean, I was driving today, and I just I, if I'm I've got a rule now that if it's not up to a certain standard, I just fast. Mm. God, that's right. What we yep, do? Do you fast right. regularly? Yep. Yeah, regu- mm, maybe once a month. Is that a thing? The, is that a thing in the CrossFit world? I know paleo was a, bit, a thing in the CrossFit world, but it's fasting. It's not. No, mm. I don't think so. It will be now. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody start fasting Boom. at the moment. Uh, <laughs> looking you'll, ahead, you'll snatch twenty more pounds if you fast one week of the month. Eventually, <laughs> <laughs> if you keep working, science out. hashtag science. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I like making those claims, and then people will be like, "That's just bro science." I was like, "You know, I was fucking joking, right?" <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no. The literal. good thing about joking forever, about joking and not letting people know when you joke, is that when you fuck up and say something wrong. You could always go back and be like, you know, I was just joking. joking. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was totally joking about I'm really that. Really, not that stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you just need to have sarcasm alerts. Yeah. What do you, uh, you? You sound like you. You obviously have a passion for fitness and health. What are you really into now in that realm? What are you studying right now? What's mm. perking your? What's making your nipple stand out? It's titillating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing a lot of. Uh, I've been looking more into uh, what's actually happening with the fascia. And uh, the, the guys over at the Human Garage are doing a really great thing with this. I'm um, talking, thinking about uh, you just try I listened to that episode, by the way. Oh, yeah, try yeah, this experiment crazy. on is like your memory is stored in the fascia. That, now, that, so that to me sounds what? absolutely fucking crazy. That does sound crazy. However, uh, when you hear them discuss it and you hear some of the science supporting it and the fact that there's a lot of shit we've learned in the last 15 years that sounded fucking insane right. yep. before that. Yep. We'll find that, out later. I've learned my lesson now. Like, yeah. Are you familiar with uh, El Doa? Have, have you learned it? Um, we're actually talking to them. Oh, are we're you? Gonna, mm. yeah. We had them in our, our facility running a certification. They'll blow your fucking mind. Really? Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you're I'm looking like forward it. to it. You'll so like, talk um, about this fascia being, being another mind or storing memory. So Quote, unquote, if you can think about your thing about your brain is the CPU potentially like the processor and then the actual memories are stored in the body. So you have to think that your entire being is involved in expressing the human experience. And I think there's been way too much emphasis put on the brain. Um, I was thinking this before I met these guys over at the human garage and then this guy had dove into it. And I was like, got it. And what first brought my attention to it was, and I wasn't thinking fascia specifically. I was thinking human body. He's the one that brought the attention of memories being stored in the fascia specifically. I was thinking it was just stored somewhere in the body, mm. gut and other things, but come to find out the gut, like this part of your body has the most fascial density. And so um, it's not the actual materials in the gut, but it's the, the fascia that holds it. Uh, and what brought my attention to this originally was, was, was it three years ago? Yeah, three years ago, I go to Peru and I'm drinking ayahuasca. Mm. And so Another great story uh, coming up. Yeah. I can feel it. <laughs> well, this is, this, is why, this is why plant medicines are good for me specifically because I get insights about myself that are ridiculous. And so I, I drink the brew and, you know, we're going through the ceremony and um, I go into my childhood and I find moments in my childhood where I was where I had experienced emotional trauma, mm. right? And, and it was obvious to me when I went back to these moments, where I was like, oh, this is an unresolved emotional trauma. And all of a sudden, I would feel a knot form in my stomach, and I would feel it move all the way up to my mouth, and then I would purge, and nothing would come out. But I would throw up into a bucket. And then, well, the ayahu- this was crazy. The ayahuasca, even though I was like purging into this bucket, he would come empty it, even though I'm just blowing up. 
like he's throwing, throwing away w- he's throwing away the energy or whatever. Like a yeah. symbol. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's real, Justin. I'm just saying okay. no- <laughs> for our <laughs> listeners in case. But, but, yeah. but you have to you have to use you have to use a rubber made bucket. So <laughs> I didn't want any magic involved. No. You know what I mean? This is science. No. Uh, you know, I again, just like you, like I don't know what I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like the, uh, all that talk, I'm I'm open to hear more about it all the time. Um, it's interesting to me because I think there's way more to it than what we can measure. And so, um, what I experienced many times in a single evening, uh, and then it happened again uh, on other nights. But I could feel this emotional trauma stored and then be released, and then it was gone forever. And I noticed that my posture changed. And oh, I could wow. physically move more freely. Wow, that's a trip. And I, my hips used to bother me so much, they stopped bothering me. And a lot of why I felt release was down in the pit of my stomach and would come all the way it, up. But see, is it hard to believe? Can you guys pick out, let me ask oh, you guys yeah. this. Can you see when a, you see, I'll give you this t- t- the typical 14-year-old girl, shoulders uh, shoulders rounded forward, hair in front of her everything's face. Pulling down right everything's there. pulling down. Everything's pulling down. What does her emotion look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can't tell me there isn't oh, some truth. Just, just holding that posture. I, I, mood, I honestly, you know? I honestly don't think that you can. And there's power postures. We know this. Yeah. Changing your posture Absolutely. changes your neurochemicals. You can't tell me. Now, maybe the language is wrong. Maybe we say memory. And as we understand memory with these neural synapses and connections, maybe it's not the same thing. Because and the language isn't explaining it right, but it makes perfect sense hmm. what you're saying. I, we see it every single day. Nobody yeah. can nobody can dispute that. Well, I don't think all memories are stored in the fascia. I just think that a lot are. And so uh, another thing that got me thinking about this, I was reading Joe Dispenza's work, and he's talking about um, thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. The explanation around the emotional trauma resides in your mind. Um, the, and it's created by the mind. The feeling is created by the body. So if you were, say, four years old and you experienced something that was very traumatic, um, by the way, between the ages of zero and seven, everything is true. You have no analytical capability. That part of your brain is just not developed mm-hmm. enough yet. That's, we, we know that children at that age, their brain waves are in um, alpha theta, which means that that's, the most impre- that, that's where you go when you meditate so you can change your mind more easily, which means that they're just highly impressionable. Extremely neuroplastic plasticity in a, in a right. child's brain is just totally. incredible. But they accept everything is true, which means that if they have this feeling and then it's coupled with uh, something that happened, they then extrapolate that to everything. So if someone's parents were yelling at each other about money when they're four years old and they think the four-year-old doesn't know what's going on, the four-year-old has just associated that really bad negative feeling with money. And so that's why you end up with a lot of people who can't figure out, we see in entrepreneurship, they can't get through that that barrier. They know what to do. They got the tools. Everything's available to them, but they just won't do it because they have this really negative emotion. Every time they the thought about money comes up, it triggers this negative emotion in their body. And so I think through many different techniques, and uh, one of the one of the techniques is going to the human garage and they actually use manual therapy to move that stuff out. And they'll be working on people and people will start crying on the table. Oh wow. Um uh, uh, memories will, actually talk memories to, will come up and you'll you'll have to surrender and re- into them. Talk to massage therapists who've been doing massage yeah, therapy is, for ask your girlfriend. Ask yeah, your, of ask course, Katrina. this is all this is all the stuff that she loves to sit around yeah. and talk about all day long. Yeah, because, because. Be, massage therapists will tell you when they're working yeah. on someone that they'll have people um, who will cry or giggle or laugh <laughs> or feel irritable or Katrina. Katrina feels. will will touch me when I come home and she'll like instantly be able to tell like. The type if of you're people horny I, or not? No, if the oh, type sorry. of people that I've been around, like she'll be able to feel that she'll be able to feel that in me it's right away from out. just putting her hands on me, like start questioning me, like who was I around, and like it's you can't all screw around, man. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, right away, if I've been around anybody that uh, that has caused me to be negative at all or stressed or I mean just the slightest bit, like it's not like she does that all the time. I mean, we've been together for six years. I can count on one hand how many times she's been like, "Whoa, who are you around today?" You know, and it's just yeah, like, interesting. Yeah. What if yeah. she's just a Jedi? What if she's just saying yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Like when it's you after she's fucking t- with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you tell your, like you tell <laughs> your kid, like I know what you, you know. You tell your kid, like I know what you did today, and they're like, yeah. uh, Is there anything you want to tell yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Uh, well, well, shit, he knows. <laughs> see, when I when I hear stuff like this, here's this this. I'll give you an example. Okay, acupuncture. Let's use that as an example. When you hear. Uh, 
people who explain acupuncture from a Chinese medicine perspective, mm -hmm. they use terminology like qi, the body's energy and flow, and there's mm -hmm. energy that's blocked, and we need to you know, let it flow through this blocked area. And so we use these, these points with the needles. And, and from a Western medicine standpoint, you're like, you're fucking crazy. What is qi? You can't see it. You can't test it. It doesn't exist. But now we know, and in fact, insurance companies cover acupuncture for pain relief. Now, I just think they're just using different languages. I think Western medicine uses a particular language, and because the language of Chinese medicine doesn't jive with it, they just, just, they just automatically throw it out. And when you say things, or they, people say things like memories are stored in the body, I, think the lang I don't think they developed the right language to explain it. I agree 100% with, that, with that, that sentiment, but I think the language is different. I think there's a, an interesting communication between the mind and the, and not just the brain, the mind, and I think the mind it, it encompasses the body and the brain. I think it's yeah. very different than just the brain. You For see sure. what I'm saying? For sure. You mean outside the body? Yes. And the, um, not only is it a different language, but it's an older language for them from the, the Eastern. Part. Yes. And so I think it's actually, not only is it a different perspective, but it's more simplified. And so they, where we like to create these really elaborate un, uh, stories so we can understand what's happening they long ago said, you know what? We don't have to understand it for it to be useful. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, one of the lessons I've learned this past year is my, my desire to understand things has kept me from knowing a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I think our entire culture suffers. Bro, from that. it is, I see that a lot. it is, they're all tools. And the Western way of understanding things is an extremely effective tool but it's a tool, and like any tool, it is limited to its job. A hammer is fucking amazing at hammering shit, for sure. But you can't screw a screw, you know, screw into the wall with it, right? It's not the right. I've tool. tried. It doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> uh, you know, Eastern philosophies. You know, uh, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. I mean, I tell you what. What I love to see is I love it when ancient m methodologies or explanations become I, not even confirmed. Just it starts to jive with other philosophies that seem to counter it. And I'll give you an example. Happening okay. so much right I'll, now. I'll give you an example. Say what? <laughs> you have a bunch you think about? I, oh, I, I, I'm seeing it so much right oh. now. I want to hear what you're saying, oh, though. So I'll give you a great example, right? Yeah. Uh, we've heard about in some of these uh, philosophies of the, 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 the third eye, right? Oh, yeah. The third eye. The third eye is located in the middle of your you head. See pine cones. In the middle of your head, yeah. right? It is literally in between. So, so people point to it in the middle of the forehead, but in reality, what they talk about, it's literally in the middle of your brain. Right. And it is the all. It is the eye that sees what the other two eyes don't see. You see more. You you know more with this eye, and they call it the third eye. And people laughed at that. Western med, you know, come on, scientists and Western medicine. What the fuck are you talking about? There's no third eye, whatever. Next thing you know, we're studying the pineal gland of the fucking brain, which is, by the way, the only part of the brain where there's one and not two sides. There is no left and right hemisphere. Right. One fucking part in the middle of this brain that produces dimethyltryptamine, which is the world's strongest hallucinogen and is likely responsible for dreaming. Dreams, yeah. So all of a sudden, they both say the same fucking thing. They just use different language. Yeah. And you see that a lot now. You're starting to see that more and more. They Quantum physics is one of my favorite There's, a lot, there's yeah. a lot that's released when you die, too. Yes. It's a massive dose. Yes. Have you, have you ever smoked DMT? I've never tried DMT. We'll see if I do in the future. But I have not. <laughs> like, What's up, man? <laughs> Did you bring some? Is that rookie? <laughs> rookie. Yeah. Part two. Part two of this podcast will be done on. He's the, he's the guy. Like if I'm going to do something like that, that's who I want to be with. Because I'd be like, no, 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 relax. He'd be. Like, I feel like he'd be able to talk me right. Yeah. Through, you know, saying yeah. that. So, he's like, don't worry. I've been here a hundred yeah. times. Yeah, <laughs> this is you, you know, I feel like you're going to see a wizard, right? Yeah. Uh, he's I got you. Go left. Do you, do you guys have you wizards? Go right. Do you have yeah. personal wizards yet? Wait a minute. Wizards? This sounds awesome. I have no, a I wizard. Don't. And where can I find one? Pube. Is Sal calls it. me the wizard every once in a while. Well, okay. Think... He's the, he's, no. But yeah, you are, he's the wizard of, uh, he's the, lady. of the wizard of the tang. Yeah. <laughs> the tang wizard. He's the tang wizard. <laughs> yeah. So he's got a big robe. We definitely it's, call him that. Yeah. It's the mustache. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just grew that too, believe it or not. Uh, it uh, looks beautiful. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you sir. <laughs> it's a look, man. It's worse. Trying to start a trend here. We'll see yeah. what happens. <laughs> it's filthy. So far, it's me. It is very filthy. I do like it. Yeah. I do. How do you, on you? So who's what's this wizard? Who's your wizard? Daniel Raphael. You weren't joking. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Wow. So what's a wizard? What, what is that? Wizard? What do you mean? Yeah. How do you classify this? All right. So um, can they summon lightning bolts? <laughs> no. Can you? Okay. Oh, you, not that uh, kind of wizard. I don't know. I mean, maybe some crazy shits happen. 
Let's see. Uh, so, uh, abracadabra. That's associated with magic, right? Okay, I thought okay. you were gonna do something to me. Oh, right here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Poop. Oh no, shit. Here we go. I'm gonna oh, take fuck. another drink. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you put in my drink? So you know what abr- cadaver yeah. means? No. Okay, so it's an Aramaic word um, that uh, means that with my words I create, or with my words I influence. So it's an actual word. Yeah. Wow. And so it's like Timbuktu. It's an actual place. Yeah. So like uh, that's associated <laughs> with magic, right? Like that, right? So abracadabra, you make something different. Mm. So oh, I've just been saying that like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> abracadabra. You yeah. had no idea you were speaking. Then Aramaic. I would just, yeah. yeah. I always I say just, bada boom, bada bing, but that's yeah. different. Bibbidi <laughs> bobbidi. <laughs> <laughs> no great history to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I'm stealing all this content from my good friend Mark England, um, who who's amazing, and he's. He uh, actually he has this whole explanation behind it that I'm stealing right now, um, and he would love that I'm doing it. And uh, so <laughs> the uh, so that's magic, and then magic is is I guess what's the definition of that? I forget. Anyways, it's one of those things where it's like you just put your attention on something, and and then it's gonna you know you make a, some type of change or whatever. Mm-hmm. So. I, Someone can look it up. Again, I smoked another joint, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> Welcome to my pumping. <laughs> yes. um, so what Daniel does is he helps me remember things differently. Gives, remember, you, a diff- gives you a different perspective on exactly. all things. On Changes memory. your memory filter. Yeah. So what we do is through conversation, he's, oh, gotten, really, sure he's gotten really smooth with it. Hmm. It used to be like a, a much more formal process. We'd get in chairs and look at each other right from like me to you. Um, and now it's one of those things where you can just be hanging out on the couch. And he's like, you want to do a session? I'm like, yeah, man, let's go ahead and do it. And, um, and then he just starts asking me questions. And I start answering. And then next thing I know, we're digging into some part of my life that has been hidden. And then uh, we reframe how I see the whole situation and create positive feelings around it. And then I start making different choices automatically after that. So I, I become like a slightly different person. So um, the, the that is very wizardly. Yeah. The memory doesn't change my perspective, like you were just saying. Mm. Yeah, that was really well mm. said. Um, and uh, so he does that, and he does a little bit of breath work, but he's he's uh, he works some magic for sure. So uh, yeah, I just call him my own. he's my wizard. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he, I think it. he charges people like five grand a day to do that kind of mm. stuff. Now, do you? So. Wow! Don't you feel and, like? And I helped him develop some of the business. So, it was Mike, a nice, nice trade. Nice yeah. trade there. Yeah, he now, does Mike, a lot of work right where we're at right now, Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, now, fantastic. do you not do you not provide the same thing in return to him? I feel like someone with your perspective <sighs> and self awareness. I feel like you could almost you could turn be, it. Back you could be somebody him. else's yeah. wizard, right? Because really, the, all that person is. Is giving you another, someone you respect enough their intelligence level. Yeah, you're gonna right, let them inside to, to yeah, yeah to give you a that. different perspective on on th- things that you may think one way and help you open your mind, right? So, do you feel like you could do the same thing? Remember, uh, do yeah, you? I have done it for him. Okay, and, and, so I would say. and uh, the way I did it for him the last time was he I had him come stay at my house for a few days, and he just got I just had him move and do the things that somebody who is really crushing and going after it. Just put him in that environment where like we work, we move, we, we do the things that, that moves the ball forward. And so um, he, he didn't really have as much experience on the business side of the house. And then I think just him being there and me having conversations with him at meals and then him witnessing what work looked like for me, I think was, uh, it was exactly what we planned and he got a massive benefit out of it. So, hmm. So that was like the last thing. But we always come up, you know, I have several friends where we just come up with, um, there's many wizards where we are constantly trying. <laughs> it's like a clan of <laughs> <laughs> It really is. I am Gandalf, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. Like, we played Dungeons yeah. and Dragons when yeah, we were yeah. kids, and now we have wizards. You're yeah. Merlin, asshole. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's like this fight. <laughs> <laughs> but when, so like there's a, I have a group of friends, and, and we basically just, uh, accept each other for where we want to be, and then we help facilitate the growth for the other wherever we see the opportunity. So it could be in the middle of a party, and just we'd be dancing, and oh, we would just say something to the other person that would that we know would just trigger them in that moment. And so yeah, it's like a lot of there's a lot of uh, pushing around going on in a 
and we all know we're doing it for each other's. So one own. might that's got to be tough. That's well, a lot of processing. Well, one one might call, constant. You know, if you were if constant. You're, you're reading and you read you read already Rise of Superman and now you're into Stealing Fire. Oh, I didn't read that. This is like, I oh, just heard about. Okay, it. so yeah. <laughs> so. I've been sleeping with a book under my pillow. <laughs> it's got to count for something. <laughs> that's right. Because yeah. that's a lot of what group flow is like. You know, this is what kind of group flow is, is this this beautiful synergy amongst each other that yeah. you're almost one, you know? and Oh, yeah, there's definitely that. Yeah, yeah There's right. a group boxer, and we're just always getting together as much as possible at the time. See, and when, I think people get so scared when you when we give it names. I know and we're all laughing and I know you said wizard and it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't yeah. that's that's just the name that you've well, given somebody who has allowed you to get this yeah. deeper perspective of yourself. Yeah, and we call it that because everyone's trained. Right. Like no it's not like people are trying to help each other out that aren't trained. Everybody's been through like everybody's a fucking wizard. Everyone's you're on the next through, level. Yeah, they've been through like several life coaching type certifications and they've studied therapies mm-hmm. and they've studied like everyone's been to like you know 30 retreats where they just get completely broken down emotionally and bring them back. Everyone, I won't say everyone, but half the people have you know done 10 day Vipassana retreats. So basically, so, highly qualified people to be helping you check your shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and everybody, and, and it's cool because everyone's willing to accept the criticism and everyone's gotten really good at delivering it and everyone's gotten really good at receiving it. I was going to say that's the tough on. part. Yeah. Cause that, cause like we, like it's a lot of, when you're in a group of people like that, I've, I, I've been in a few groups with a few groups of people where you're in that kind of an environment and it's both awesome. And it's both, it's also very, can be very fucking challenging because it's constant. Sometimes does it feel like constant processing when you're around each other? Like, okay, I need to go fucking play video games by myself real quick because mm. I just can't process anymore. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't hang out with them all the time. I, It'd be exhausting, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, we all have a lot of alone time. And I think, I think everybody has a, in, in our group, has a pretty good balance of, of me, you know, me time, group time, and then also time where we're, we're investing and taking action on, on uh, what we're learning. And so it's like just this cycle. That's how I see it anyway. Hmm. What are you working on right now for yourself? What's the big challenge? Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would say there is any challenges. Excellent. Well, what would you say that you recently worked through then? What was like a oh, big, what, that one's easier to spot. You know what? <laughs> Actually, you know what? No, you know what? Some people might be thinking, oh, you don't have a challenge. Actually. Finding the challenges, just like eighty percent, ninety percent of the challenges, well, of course, not all the challenges. That's the self awareness piece. Most yeah. people don't. So it's like you awareness. don't know it until you're in it. Well, one, once I'm aware of it, it's days. Right. So it's right. it's not a, yeah. So like I'm waiting. Um, oh, I do feel like so. Uh, the last thing that I learned on a new level, I think this would be really helpful for your audience, is um, I became way less competitive and much more collaborative. And so these are things that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Interesting. Explain uh, that a little bit. What, what do you mean by competitive we, we, versus yeah, collaborative? I love this. We talk about this. Yeah. So um, I think so. competition <coughs> can be healthy or not healthy and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, when it's unhealthy, it gets in the way of collaboration. So I, w- I personally have been pretty good. I-, I noticed a few months ago that I was being competitive even with people on my own team in some ways, um, and then I was, I had a lot of pride, and I was holding on to quite a few things, mm. and it was emotionally challenging for me to let those things go, even though, you know, the my brain said, you know, hey, dummy, let go of this. It really was hard for my body to let it go, and I, what I noticed was um, there were remnants of pride. There were, there were habits that were built from pride, which I had shed, but the habit still existed. And so I had to just consciously go and, and change some of those habits around, uh, around competition and always being, need to be, being seen as the best. What have you, now that you've gone through that and you're more collaborative, uh, how, much, how different are things? Everything's so much easier. Easier. Yeah. Less stress. Less stress and more flow. It's like everything's happening like three times faster than it used mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. Like everything. Like, not just in myself, but in the company too. So everything is just snapping together, and it's I'm having a really good time. Now to get to the bottom of that, did you have to dig real deep and find? Or look oh at yeah, the, the, I got it, sick for two weeks. I was gonna say, did you wow. get, get into you, inner? Yeah, tell me. Tell what me. What do you mean you got sick? 
<clears throat> so I, I, um, I had the real. I was at this conference. I was in Pasadena, actually. I was at Archangel Academy, and I was at this basically a business mastermind. Two days, and on the middle of the second day, I got hit with like a lot of anger, and I noticed that there were there was like multiple factors that like hit me like in a five minute period. Like no one of these things would have impacted me. But it was like it was like a cumulative effect. It was like a five car pile up, you know? <laughs> and it was just like and I just got plowed and I just the rest of the day I couldn't learn. I um and uh it's like I and I was just angry. And then uh on my ride home I'm like, what the fuck is going on with me? Like I can't I can't figure out why I'm angry. Why am I angry? Why am I angry? And then I realized that I was experiencing some I don't know if jealousy would be the right word, but some something along those lines. Um, a little bit of jealousy and uh, in business, and uh, like looking at other people in your in your field doing things in your team. He, um, no, it was outside the company, mm. but yeah, it was like being, you know, just being in a room full of highly successful business. Oh, people I see. Yeah. And, and feeling that, like that, I should be, be that, doing better than that guy. I should be doing better than that guy. That was a part of it. Yeah, yeah, it was a part of it. There, there was also, yeah. It, it, it's multi-layered because there were things that weren't happening at the conference simultaneously at, mm. s- with some other people. Mm. And it was one of those things where, yeah, it, it just triggered the shit out of me. And I hadn't gotten triggered like that in a long time. I was like really, I, I remember getting so angry at me like this. I haven't felt like this in years. I was like, what is going on? So I go on about my day. I drive home the next day. By the time I get home, I mean, I'm just running. Like, like my mind has never been, so piled up, you know, it, it's been years. And by the time I get home, I'm just exhausted. Like a three hour drive. I get home, I'm just exhausted. Not only that, I hit traffic at every corner. Ugh. It was more than three hours, like five. And I get home and I just pass out and wake up in the middle of the night sick as a dog. And it was like, and, it's, and I was sick for about eight hours when I realized that I had done it to myself. And I was like, I totally just, just went nuts and just drove myself into the ground. And I was like legit sick, like running a fever, all that kind of stuff. So then, um, but then I realized I ran myself in the ground and then it, it took me two weeks before I could like just train again. Yeah. It hit me hard. And, uh, and I, it, it caused me to slow down and get some reflection on what was going on for me. The really interesting, interesting thing is, is at that time, I was signed up to go to a 10-day Vipassana retreat, and just silent meditation. I was supposed to be on that retreat, but I didn't make it off the wait list. In fact, there was something strange happened because I somehow got removed from it. Hmm. Like Other people that were behind me got in. I'm like, something, something fishy's up. So I think I was supposed to have that experience that I would not have gotten at the retreat. Oh, shit. In meditation. I would have gotten something in meditation. That's a very interesting perspective. So I'm sitting at home, sick, getting... In your own Vipassana. Yeah, forced. exactly. I'm just laying in bed. I don't, I, like, I don't own a TV. I don't do anything. I, I, so I'm not going like, to veg out when I'm sick and just watch TV. I don't do that. I just sit in it. <laughs> that sucks. That sounds twisted, Jesus bro. Jesus Christ. Oh, but, my God. But I'm convinced. I watched 16 and Pregnant. I'm convinced. <laughs> My girl makes fun of me all the time. I'm convinced I'm going to get something out of it. So I just like sit there. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we might eat me all too, bro. Me too. too right? What the fuck are you doing? Watch? I'm going to get something out of this for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I promise this season. I promise. Oh. I don't know. I, I think it has something to do with I feel like shit and I want to see somebody else that I feel sorry for. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so you're, you're laying there, forced Vipassana. What do you see? Oh, yeah. I just, I, I just had flashbacks for days of moments when I, uh, my attempts of being competitive hurt collaboration that would have moved things forward in a lot of aspects of my life, not just business. Mm. But they definitely showed up in business, showed up in personal relationships, it, it was. Wow. I I recognized. Oh, I do this, man. I don't know. <sighs> yeah. So I, one of the <laughs> things I recognize that I do is I am very very flirty with women, mm. and so um, I like to show up at parties with more than one, and <laughs> I uh, <laughs> and I like uh, I like to like make a show of it mm-hmm. a little bit, and um, so I recognize that. 
yeah, I I enjoy that, but the the part of it, it it's all about competition. And uh, I don't think it's all about competition. I think that there's a lot of what initiated that behavior was competition, mm. was showing other guys. I got the girls. Like, hey, man. <laughs> I don't just have one. So I got two, but three. My, you know, like, they're hanging in. out with me. They're going coming home with hot. me. Yeah. yeah. Mike, have you connected yet how far back that stems from what's caused that behavior to now? Have you gone that far back? Like to think what happened somewhere in your impressionable ages that has – driven that personality to come out of you right oh yeah i mean it was it was um uh, just trace it back to a lot of it had to do with uh not man it, it was yeah it was really funny connected in that i i grew up i was one of the less uh wealthy kids in the, my friends group growing up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so one of the things that I experienced was driving the shittiest car out of all my friends. Yeah. Like they Dude. all had like new SUVs oh, and I had yes. like, yeah, the shitty car. And, uh, and I'm actually really appreciative of that at that time. But at that time I, I, de- I felt like I couldn't get, I didn't want to like go on dates in my shitty car mm-hmm. when my friends had really good cars mm-hmm. and the separator was money. And so, and, uh, and so like in business, I think what I was dealing with was, there was the feeling would never go away no matter how much money I made or how many girls that I was hanging out with and being seen with that would make it, um, that would be, be enough. It would never be enough. You were treating the symptom and not the cause. Yeah. And so I, I, kinda, I went back and got right with my relationship with m- money mm. and with women both. Mm. And so I've gotten, I've gotten right with that in that regard. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always more work to be done. Um, (laughs) Like understatement. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I trace that back to just, yeah, not feeling like girls like me and it being tied to, you know, my status. Mm -hmm. And so now I like to enjoy, you know, well, you know, for, (laughs) for more pure reasons. Of course. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why are you banging four chicks I, over there? You it's know, pre- this is all very pure. <laughs> Purity. Pure. Hello. It's not competition. Yeah. Right. I'm just yeah. enjoying. Well, this is where collaboration comes <laughs> in. <laughs> okay. collaboration. And not competition. <laughs> it's not, We're a team. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I, I believe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I think I'm, that, I'm just a naturally flirty guy. Though. Well, I yeah. think I think this is the hard part. I, I knew to ask you that because uh, you know I totally identify with that for sure. A very very similar, yeah. up, very very similar mm-hmm. upbringing. Very very similar uh, going through that. Uh, mm. I remember going through it in my 20s when um, so I was the poor kid out of all my friends. I had friends that were rich kids. Mm-hmm. And I had the shitty car, all those things. So <clears throat> I remember a good part of my 20s I spent on my friends and the trips and picking up the tabs, like all to feed this ego, you know what I'm saying? And, and meanwhile that I, you know, after, but I feel like there's a part, right? The empathetic part that you have to have on yourself is that you have to realize that part of you had to kind of go through that though. Right. Because if you can't, if you can't have compassion for yourself, you can't learn from it. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I, I do believe on the same, and I'm sure you would agree with this, but a lot of that is also what drove you, right? And For what, sure. Right, initially drove it's, you. It's, it's what got me where I am, and it's what's exactly holding me back from moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, how I, do you, and how do you change something that's gotten you so far? That is the challenge, right? Like, it's gotten me this far. Right, yeah, yeah. because, because uh, something that's worked for a long time, that's a lot of repetition. That's, that's greased the groove right down your right. brain saying, this is a good idea. Mm-hmm. And not only that, we've done it so many times we identify it with it as something that I do. This is me. This is yeah. part of who I am. Yeah. And so letting go and killing off a piece of yourself is, can be the ch- most challenging Brutal. piece. How many times have you killed off pieces? I was of just going to ask you. It, give me another one. Give me another one that you've, that you had to, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know there's more. Fucking there's a, a. There's a shit ton. <laughs> I, I, you know what? You know what? I, I, for me personally, I notice the more I do that, the more I do it. In other words, like yeah. the first time was well, very more, difficult, took forever. Right. The more comfortable like, you come with it. And I'm like, holy shit, this is never going to stop, but this is also Sounds great. like a haiku. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's dope when you have a partner <laughs> who's very like minded like that, too, when you can have come home with somebody who's yeah. like that, who can kind of like. 
to me, that's why I feel so blessed. And, you know, we can sit here and talk all day long about, you know, everyone's philosophy on love and all that shit. But for me, like, there's well, that's nothing. That's exactly where I was going to go. <laughs> right? We're going to go that direction? Is, you know, that to me is, is so, such so amazing is to have someone uh, finally in my life where I can come home and I can, I can play that checks and balances and be open to that. I feel like every day is growth. Yeah. You know? And yeah, that's it's, that's huge, and, and I think when I when I evaluate clients and and their relationships and stuff like that, it, that is one of the hardest barriers I have to break through psychologically with them is that they also don't have they may be ready like that's already hard enough right it's already fucking hard enough to get somebody else in that mindset and ready for that and then you finally get them and then their partner is fucking oh man one of the side not, effects uh, of one of the biggest side effects woo, of major transformation oh, no, right? obstacle one of the big side effects of major transformations is breakups and divorce it's a fact yeah, I mean, I'm talking about all major transformations weight loss sure. personal whatever sure. it's very difficult but if both people transform together that is you that is one of the most strengthening things you could possibly do you're talking that, about that's what my wife and I have done mm -hmm. we've been together for we've been married 7 years and yeah like a lot of the transformation was not simultaneous, but it's definitely been, we've been f helping facilitate each other's growth as a sign of a really good relationship. Well, you can see that, that, that <clears throat> trace it back to that one day where you had that, that moment <clears throat> sure. with her, right? For sure. Well, yeah. I, I would love to hear some, um, and I've talked a little bit on our podcast about this, that once I felt like I really tapped into this and realized this, um, now or Katrina and I both, uh, we we make we make a conscious effort to to fuel it, yep. you know, and to promote that growth. Have you have you found things that uh, that you guys do to to do that? Oh yeah, we um we like to go. There's a there's a couple different relationship coaches we really like, and they put on retreats. Mm -hmm. Oh shit! Write this down. Actually, we're recording. And I'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. Never mind. <laughs> Actually, if anyone wants to know more about these sure, retreats, grandpa, they, these are these retreats. Uh, they're put on by my friends Brian and Jennifer. <laughs> oh, you go to evolvinglove.us. You will see their website, um, Evolving Love, Brian and Jennifer. Uh, theirs is not for the faint of heart, so um, you're 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 gonna like break down at some it's like point. Oh wow! Like hmm. probably. Like I, I got completely emotionally wasted by the end of the weekend. Hmm. Like, I had to take breaks. Um, in fact, I most retreats where there's that kind of work being done, I go deep really fast, and then. Like, I can't make it. I, I always have to take some time away, um, it seems. <laughs> too deep, too fast. It's happened. Yeah. yeah. I, um, so <laughs> we went to, last year, I'll, I'll just tell you the two most impactful things for a relationship. Last year, we did that retreat with Brian and Jennifer, and whew, game changer. Then we did something called Circling, which is put on by the Integral Center out of Boulder. And Circling is a uh, mm, relational meditation is the best way to put it. Mm. Um, and there's just a way of communicating and opening up and teaching. You learn to be present with another individual and you practice all weekend. And you think you got your shit together. <laughs> Until you try to like do that. You get, you get into relational meditation. I'm, <clears throat> I'm talking 10 minutes and I was broken down, bawling. Wow. Like crazy. And Damn. because I, I got to this place and the people who facilitate these, there's like five people on one and they're circling one person. And you're learning as you're doing it. You're a participant in the circling process. So there's a rotation. And, um, and the facilitator is guiding the conversation. And everyone's just reflecting back to you what they're feeling from you and, and thinking, you know, the oh, thoughts shit. that are coming to them. Like, very, like, like no filter. Oh, no filter. Shit. No filter. I'm sharing, what are you doing? Uh, you know, like, oh, my experience with you is, you know, I might be frustrated. I don't think you're sharing very well. And just like, <laughs> But it's just, you're getting hammered. And I remember for 10 minutes, I was like, I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> and all of a sudden, yeah. I, um, what was I working on at the time? Oh, yeah, I was working on um, women are a burden. And so um, that, I had this story in my, from my past. Like when I was, like, um, I, think, I think a lot of men probably have this. Um, that I, after being in a relationship with a woman for a certain amount of time, I always get frustrated. And when they ask for things. Hmm. And so I had this story from my childhood, which is, you know, women are a burden. And so, you know, I tr treat my mom that way. You know, any woman I'm in a long-term relationship with, I end up treating like they're a burden. And not overtly, it just, it's a subtle energy sure. that just, like, just ruins everything. 
Well, what's the what's the childhood thing that stemmed that? I mean, um, it it was just the way I was raised. Yeah. Hmm. So it was it was an it was an underlying thing that probably just came from my dad, my mom and dad's parents, and hmm. it's just one of those things. It's a cultural. It's something that just runs. Some some things are passed down for so long. Yeah, it's absolutely. not like an, it's not like a traumatic event happened in your life. Just the way things are done. And, and there's when they when they you know you may hear about people healing things from their ancestry. That would be an example of healing something from your ancestry that is was passed down, but there wasn't a single like the woman mo- stays imprint. in the kitchen. She doesn't leave the she, exactly. Yeah. It's just it's just yeah. how things are, yeah. right? And so, um, <clears throat> yeah. So I I was brought up that way. You know, and it wasn't big overt at all. I, I grew up in a very happy home, and um, but I but I recognized that was the case, so I had to go back and heal that. Mm-hmm. And that happened during that session. Is I had all these flashbacks. I I saw the exact moment actually. Not now that you say it, now I'm like having a flashback now. <laughs> That's why I gotta ask. I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, sometimes the memories just stream. But I remember. I remember there was a point when I was about 15 where my mom asked me, started asking me for advice, which I didn't feel was appropriate. Like about you know. Uh, where it very made it feel like I was an adult. Mm. You know, it was like she was no longer raising me. Mm. And the things that she was running by me was really stressed me out. Mm. And so that's when I started seeing. So when women ask me for advice, when I'm in a long-term relationship with them, giving women advice got to be a burden. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a very similar, (laughs) so we got (laughs) You and I got a very similar story. (laughs) Yeah. So, (laughs) And, um, and so it was really making my relationship very strained. And once I recognized that that was, and I just had this whole breakdown process and it happened during a relational meditation exercise. And, and that was great for us. And the funny thing is, is when they formed that circle, they did a random thing. My wife was in the circle with me and I was like, is it okay for my wife to be in the circle? Like, they were like, she's a bit biased. They were like, they were like, they were like I don't know. What do you think? And oh was, God! And I was like, reflect it right back. To you. I was like, well, I might not open up and be vulnerable if she's present. I'm less likely to. And you know what? This is why I'm fucking here. Because if I can't be open and vulnerable with her, what's the point? So I was like, fuck it, keep her in the group. And having her there just—that's what made it what it was. It wouldn't have come through had she not been there. Um, so that particular workshop was not for couples but it was just about how to more authentically relate with other people and so you know it's technically a relationship workshop just not a romantic um, relationship workshop so we did both of those last year which and Ashley had her own you know revelations from each experience and um, that's been incredible for us um, oh the, the thing we did before that um, in the years before, one of the tr- most transformative uh, things for our relationship has been Burning Man. So going to Burning Man has been... How many right. times have you been? I've been twice. She's been three times. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, you, you, you do these retreats. What about something on, like, on a simpler? And I'll give you an example. Like For me, one of the things that I had to work through was um, I have such a hard time shutting the work mode and the brain off because of that driven, crazy side, right? Oh, yeah. That when I walk through the door, I can like beeline to my computer sure. or straight to working more until I'm not, so, such to the point that I can walk right past my girl, especially after you've been in six years in a relationship, you know? For sure. And so I actually literally have to like do this like, you know, breathing technique before I go in the door to yeah. like just get refocused on being present and not literally, you know, still working in my head. And when I walk in the door, actively go over to her, kiss her and ask her right up right away. Cause if I don't do it right away and I don't do that, then easily it's, it's a wrap, you know? And, you know, and she's, what's great about her is she knows how to just kind of give me the, the, give me that win, that window and latitude to kind of let me go in and figure it out for myself without checking me, you know, but I know that that's something I have to pre- put in practice. Do you yeah. have things like that, that, You've had to put in practice. Mm, we do a date night every week. Okay. It's not negotiable. That's so, cool. Um, before bed. And are, uh, you str- are you true to that? Because a lot of yes. people say that, and then they're like, eh, and we yep. try. But yeah. that's like we, not. No, no, no. It happens. And if, and if it gets moved, it's like a real reason it got moved, and we make up for it. Yeah. There's no. And in fact, there's been a lot of. Since we started doing that, we started having like a second or third night a week. Right. Mm-hmm. Because we. I enjoyed it. Fucking great. enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I've done the same we're with like, my wife. Yeah. And so we also ask each other what we were grateful for that day. 
Mm. Um, and, you know, and then uh, we also, and then sometimes it gets into, it depends on how, much, how tired we are. Uh, and then we'll, a lot of times we'll ask, you know, what did you do today that you want to be praised for or acknowledged for? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, I can think of a lot of things I did. Fucking <laughs> 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 Sal. <laughs> Honey, you got a minute? You got a pen? <laughs> that's right. That's right. I got a plethora. It's funny yeah. you asked. They printed it Here on Here we list. go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a machine gun about you. It's phone. in alphabetical order. You've been keeping track for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are, those are great. Great questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah I uh, just, I just, I love. Okay, I love when people talk about awareness, talk about these things they do. But then I also think that a lot of people talk like this, and then they don't put in the practices. And and I think that, like you know, Katrina and I, are, I, I believe very, very self aware people, and I read a lot in this field, and I love this stuff. Now, but I've even realized that you know when you've got habits, especially that have been formed since childhood, that are these insecurities or things that we're, yeah. we're struggling with, and it's always work, right? It's never, it's never done, right? Is that there's, there's things that well, there, there, you, you'll move out of the phase eventually. Well, so work in that particular area can be done. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. But uh, it's something that you a- actively have to be conscious of, though, right? It's not something that you can just say, "Oh, I fixed that," and then it'll never, well, well, it'll never um, resurface or it'll never show itself again. Well, you can move those types of things into uh, unconscious competence. Yes. So, like, I, 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 there are definitely things that that I thought might be recurring, but that I've completely wiped, and it's, it's, it's like it was never there. Yeah. Hmm. So, what, what, do which ones come to mind that are more challenging? Like when you think of things like you just wiped, like oh, you know what? I put I connected those dots, realized it, moved on. Well, Which yeah, ones you got to like connect the- those dots in so many aspects of your life, and then there's like a point where you're like, wow, I think I've applied this to just about every fucking I think situation, I understand- and now it's my automatic behavior. Mm. When something new comes in, I go, I immediately go to this new frame of mind versus going, fuck you. Oh wait, oh I can see this differently because that's where, like, that's conscious competence. Mm-hmm. And then the unconscious competence is just where automatic. Automatic. So that can happen with your mind. You just have to put. But you have to conscious. You have to consciously be competent in many, many different ways with that same lesson. Well, and don't you? Wouldn't you yeah, say so like personal responsibility or letting go is the first lesson, right? Personal responsibility is the second lesson, and so like learning to apply personal responsibility yeah. to every aspect of your life. That takes a while. That takes a while mm-hmm. before you start stop blaming other people for your current it's like situation. The account- it's accountability. Well, matter. I'll tell you what. I had I, I had this experience with uh, you know my own body image issues. What drove me in fitness originally was because I, I felt like I was uh, inadequate and I had to build muscle and yeah. I wasn't big enough. And uh, once I really realized that it was rooted in these insecurities. Um, it didn't become unconscious competence until I applied it towards the bad things I was doing to my body, towards my obsession with supplements, towards how I treated myself with my workouts, towards the way I ate, to the clothes I wore. I wouldn't wear a fucking shirt unless it didn't make me look muscular. Right. It couldn't be baggy because then I'd look small. And I had to apply it to so many different things, and now it's becoming, it's not there yet, but it's becoming much more automatic. So I can completely relate to what you're saying. It makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. I think there's always new levels too. And I, I was speaking about the personal responsibility thing. There's the personal responsibility I have to take for my, my relationship with my wife. And then I have to, my personal responsibility with my job at work. And then if my job, if that role changes, then it's like I have to learn it all over again with the new role. It's an interesting situation until it does become that automatic behavior. Um, yeah. Do you guys make this, uh, is this a part of your training with your business? Do you and your partners do this kind of stuff together? This kind of work together? Um, yeah. Are they as open to it as you are? It's not a formal thing. It's okay. just a, it's actually baked into our culture. So it's just kind of how we do business. So uh, especially with, yeah, Doug, Rob, yeah, all, all the owners are very big into uh, helping each other out and like pushing the other people. And yeah, it's not a formal like process, but it's just how we interact. Now, is everybody uh, fully, I know you're not, so is, is everybody else uh, completely engaged in just Barbell Shrugged? Or does everybody also have uh, other projects that they have their hands in too? No, everybody's 100%. Everyone is. Yeah. I feel like people in, in, in fitness who are truly uh, passionate about wellness, and the term wellness now it gets misused, I think, or, or at least people interpret it as... Uh, this kind of hippie, you know, herbal herbs and 
meditate and you know fitness means this over here and performance means this over here and it's oh, like, they've got it all separated yeah but wellness really encompasses just overall everything right just being right. well and i think what i found is people that truly are passionate about it end up where you're at now where we're going right now whereas you start to look at all wellness, whereas first it becomes wellness with your fitness, with your exercise, right? And you right. examine that and you break that down and <clears throat> then you, you hit this new level and then it's all of a sudden it's now with nutrition and it goes, it evolves from macros and calories to whole foods and then it evolves from needing to eat to build muscle but then eating to, to just feel good and be well and then it moves past that into eventually you get to this po- point where you're involved with developing just yourself as a person. It's all connected Right. But it's funny because it takes you down the same. It's the same road. Yeah, everyone. Well, everyone starts at a different point, and then starts coming to the same conclusions. Takes a while. That's all. Some people stay off on the train. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Let's be honest. Not everybody gets to the destination, bro. Well, is there a de- is there even <laughs> well, a destination? You know, that might just be you know the next life. You know, <laughs> <laughs> is there even a destination? I guess is the question. Well, yeah, we yeah. could argue that there, there is no not. Spirit. There isn't. It's technically a journey for everybody, and everybody's is individual, but. There are some truths that I think that you uh, that we start to find out the deeper you dive into all this, you know, and that's the reason why you know go, you know rewinding back probably an hour ago in this podcast when I asked you about just your thoughts of IIFYM because I knew where you would take it and where you would go. Because, <laughs> you know, to me it's elementary. I'm not predictable, huh? Yeah, no, it's not that you're predictable at all. We're very like minded, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. well, I think when you you've got when you've got people searching for you know looking for at, at the journey the right way or at least looking at the journey and examining it, you start to come to similar conclusions. I think is typically what happens. Even though people come from different walks, like you came from CrossFit, I couldn't have come from a different, more different area of fitness. Uh, but we're but a lot of the conclusions you're you've come to are the same ones that yeah. I might have come with it to. Yeah, the one I've been really em- embedding in my mind as a as a truth right now is uh, that we are not nouns, we are verbs, and so I think everyone when you refer to yourself in a, in a way that you're a noun, a thing, you're a thing, like a, in a static, you're static, you know. For a thing to be named, it has to stop, mm-hmm. right? And time has to stop to measure something. Um, and so, uh, but a verb is an action. It's a process. And, uh, and if we think about ourselves as a verb versus a noun, I think we'd be much more comfortable with, with moving forward. Oh. I think, I think we should call tasty. We- I think we should call Webster. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my verb. No, I, I tell you what, I think on a literal... <laughs> On a literal level, that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. On a literal set level, He's you're never, salty. you're never, you're never staying the same, right? Yeah. But on a on a spiritual level, um, it makes perfect sense. And on a scientific level, um, even beyond that, I mean, of course, even, even, we're, we're bacteria. We turn over what every five years. We're completely even different be, when you even think about before, it, right? Even even if you we're, go beyond that, I'm you're more more you're like that. on a cellular for, for level, me it's like every three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm burning up. <laughs> <laughs> but even like deep, in a bad way, like, I'm, I'm getting old way too quick. <laughs> even yeah. deeper, you go on a quantum level. You, I mean, literally, you are popping in and out of existence. Uh, it, it, at all times, you know, at, at a quantum level. So. To say that you're a, a, a verb is much more accurate, I would say, than than a noun. You're Have we had enough weed? Yeah. Where, did, where did you get? <laughs> where, you're nothing. Where man. did you get that from? Where did you hear that first? Do you remember? He made it up. He invented it. Mm, it was a conversation. I think my friend Dana Schmuckenberger dropped yeah. that one on me. Maybe. Man, I can't keep up with who. who Yo, I, what I, I don't to expect who. you to. I, to so I thought maybe. Yeah. I'll take credit for almost nothing <laughs> when someone asks. <laughs> Where'd you get that? <laughs> somebody. Yeah. Somebody. somebody. <laughs> I got to learn that. <laughs> no, Sal's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just came up with that. <laughs> the car, I had that idea before yeah. it was invented. Well, I don't know how many times I've sat down with friends and gotten in a really deep conversation. And then when we both come out, we're like, whose idea was that? Who cares? And then it was like, like, well, it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. I was like, <laughs> it was ours. Okay, cool. Well, that's the really that's the funny joke yeah. with Mind Pump is that we tease we tease Sal like he's the one who does it, but he really doesn't give a fuck. No one really gives a fuck, and we really do at the end go like, damn, that was a fucking great idea. Who said that? Yeah. You know, who came up with it? <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot, a lot, a lot. Do you guys know as a business? Do you guys uh, something we we do? I don't know if you do this. Maybe after you fucking finish stealing fire, you'll want to. Is we go like on like a like a retreat like we're basically doing here. 
uh, only just us and we're business focused and we'll spend like three days like disconnected. We detached. put ourselves in a total flow state and just yeah. come out with programs yeah, and ideas. Yeah, and- we come up here to uh, evaluate the business or create and then we... Yeah. You guys do that? Yeah, we do retreats and yeah. How often do you guys do that? <sighs> yeah, we were really good about it in the beginning and then um, we, we were not as good at it as I would like to have been in 2016 and we had one this year that was really good and we're going to do a second one this year. Uh, in August, so we'll get two in two big ones where there's twenty or thirty people there, and uh, and then the the executive team will meet up like every three months. So you get you guys started in 2012. What was your most difficult year? 2016. Why? Um, that's when we made the most radical change. Hmm. Yeah, that was the uh, we decided to pivot the entire business essentially and move away from. Um, taking the emphasis off of training programs and putting them more into the gym owner. Mm. Yeah. In hindsight, was that a, was that a right decision or was it too soon to tell? No, it was the, it was the best decision ever. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It was, what was so challenging about making that decision? I mean, obviously looking back, you're like, now you're saying it, you're like, that was best decision ever. But looking back, it must've been fucking tough, right? Very, very. What was uh, hard about it? <sighs> Uh, yeah, there's some people that were with the company that aren't with the company anymore. Mm. Um, there was, um, there was a, now what do you think caused that Mike? Do you think it's because they, they were so stuck on doing it this way? They were happy with the money they were making with it. What was it that kept them stuck there? And so the rest of you want so to if I'm going to take a hundred percent responsibility for it, it would be because I didn't, um, I, I think I could have been clearer with painting, uh, a vision of the future of where we were going. I could have been much more clear. I mean, I was doing the best I, I could have done. So I have compassion for myself in that regard. And I recognize that the thing that I could have done differently was paint a better vision of the future and check in with everybody and make sure that that's where we were all going. Mm-hmm. And instead, I began, I began making decisions without communicating the vision. And one of the things I learned last year is to make the vision as specific as possible and over-communicate it. Like I should be tired of saying it. People should be tired of hearing it, and uh, which they won't. Um, <laughs> but uh, or you're fired. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's right. <laughs> no, uh, you know. So those were the pieces, and a lot of that I I had to mature through. I had to go through that process to see the power of communicating vision and having a specific vision. So it really helped me grow a lot in that regard, and it cost me a lot of fucking money. Um, and it was hard on, you know, uh, because it cost so much money, uh, it was a strain on all my relationships. So mm. most of my relationships are business. And then, especially uh, since money was your thing, that was your, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's funny how I, after I cleared that up, all of a sudden everything got really nice. Clear. Mm. <laughs> uh huh. Ironic, right? Yeah. How <laughs> fucking, you know, it's so funny. You learn these lessons over and over again. I've learned my lessons and you guys have learned yours. And every time you're like, just trust the process, and then you don't fucking trust the process. It's got to be fucking pulling out your teeth every time. Yeah, and this is, well, this is why I've been on a on a on a path of becoming more sensitive, because if, <laughs> because if I could sense the lesson sooner, it'd be a lot less painful. <laughs> yeah. so I could I could change, and it would be less disruptive to everyone around. You me. know, I got it. Makes me think of that something here. I wonder if the motivation to be more sensitive is as important as wanting to be sensitive. In other words, you know, right now I want to be more sensitive because I don't want to feel as much pain, but maybe that's another roadblock. Well, it's not about feeling less pain. It's about growing faster. So if I'm going down the road and I'm bouncing from side to side, uh, it's going to take me a lot longer to get there. But if I can sense that I'm getting off center, you know, in a split second, mm-hmm. I'll get to my destination a lot faster. Keeps the line straighter. That's right. Yeah. The Dow. Yeah, there's still left and right. But Dow Day Jing. <laughs> the middle way. <laughs> so looking ahead, <laughs> looking ahead, what's, uh, what's in the future for you and, and where do you think the direction of your company? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, Barbell Shrugged, we're going to... Um, but I'll just talk about by the end of 2018. By the end of 2018, we're ramping up our media team, uh, building something we've n- never built before, 
and it's going to be epic. We're going to create some next level shows for Barbell Business, doing the same thing for that show. And we are putting all of our effort into the box owner. And we are going to dominate the market in that regard. And that if people are box owners and they're not working with us, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm. Like, why would you open a box and not work with us? Now, we talked a little bit about this off air. What do you see when you look at you know gym boxes right now? Um, and I think we can agree there's a lot of stuff going wrong and there's a lot of help that's needed. Yeah, what's the biggest mistake? Yeah. Well, it's in, well the biggest mistake, I would say, is uh, people open up the gym for the right reason. They want to help people. They want to build a community. They love CrossFit. Um, they all, all this stuff. And then once they get in it, the business side of the house and not having money stresses them so out so much that they become bad coaches. Hmm. And so we either have people who are stressed out or and then and then what happens with a lot of people is they either get stressed out and just sell their gym or close it down or whatever or they go way too, they go really deep into the business side of things and they let the culture die. And so what they do is they end up um, you know, learning some business tactics and they they start getting some tactics for pumping up their membership all the while retention is going down. And so you're filling a bucket with a big hole in it. Yeah. And so what happens is a lot of people, if they don't get out of the business, a lot of them overcompensate and they step so far out of the business that it sucks the culture out and the soul out of the gym. And now it's just robotic. And then it's going to just end up being a pain in the ass anyway. So what we're doing is we're helping uh, box owners uh, build a, a system for their business that revolves around them as a person and as a cult while we we want to scale up what they have while maintaining the culture that already exists and then also removing right the stress. culture oh so it's <laughs> very close yeah, cult, 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 we cult want to help you with it's, the cult that you've yeah, created yeah. <laughs> well, now you guys you guys are only you you're only are Not you far only, off <laughs> are you only <laughs> pun intended are you are you only specializing in crossfit facilities or are you doing uh, regular gyms too so um, our coaching programs are open to uh, small gyms. They don't have to be a CrossFit affiliate, but they can be a box. My software right now, that software only works with CrossFit boxes right Got now. Got you. And we'll be opening up to other boxes that run similar models um, in the middle of summer. What's a, I've always wanted to know. I have buddies that do CrossFit, and we've you know talked a little bit about numbers, but I think you're a much better guy to talk to about this. What are normal what are what's what's really good numbers as far as being an owner that you can make running a crossfit crossfit facility and then what are shitty numbers and then what's the average so or what most people some of it depends on what part of the country you're in of course so you know well i don't know average size box you know good area well here's the thing is the way that the way the the structure is and the community works in crossfit Mm -hmm. 100 you need to be able to make your money off 150 members Okay, interesting. So uh, some people can pull it off and they have a, a more sophisticated leadership style in their organization, mm-hmm. but then that takes a whole, that's, that's, just, that's, a, that's a whole other click mm-hmm. most gym owners don't want to even be at. And so um, 150 members, uh, Dunbar's number, are you guys familiar? Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a, as a human being, I can only maintain 150 uh, close relationships. Oh yeah, okay. I'm familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beyond that, you know, I start forgetting people's names. It I don't seems to be a, lo- a limit of the human mind, right? And so, um, yeah, 150. It's funny because it ends up being that way. A lot of small churches are the same way. Speaking of cults, so the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, <laughs> uh, take it in full circle. <laughs> 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 But uh, <laughs> shit, where was I going? <laughs> oh, I <laughs> myself. I know you fucking, that was bad right there. No, so one fifty is the oh, number yeah, they need to be at. So they get, they just got it. So I ask gym owners a lot of times, like, how much money you want to make? All right, divide that by one fifty. <laughs> there you go. That's how much. All I got to do is charge ten thousand dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, and and I had to get to that point in the business. To I was like, I don't want to be in this business if I can't make what I can't what I can make. And I realized, and I had to bump my prices to be the most expensive person in town. So I think, I think a gym that's doing well on average is probably doing 40 to 50,000, uh, 
That's gross. Yeah, mm-hmm. a month, and then you know, I think there's some. I think the average is probably doing like the average gym that it's a, the owner's full time job is probably doing between fifteen and twenty. Mm. And then there's just a ton of gyms that are you know it's it's nobody's full time gig, mm. so it's kind of hard. You know, they might be doing like one thousand a month or eight thousand a month. They're just paying the bills. They're not paying the owners at all. The ones that are actually, doing- I would say that would and that would make up the majority. Mm. So, like with any business, uh, fitness is one of those things. It's like a, it's like you got to be there, man. You have to be there, and you got to be in it and love it. And, and at least in the physical sense, the the gym. Industry. Well, it sounds like to me it's a little oh. bit. I I see, and right. I know some CrossFit gyms that do over a million uh, a year. Wow! And and those gyms, God, the numbers you have to be cranking out to do that. Lots of personal training happening, mm. so oh. they're not running the group class model. So ah. it's a mix. It's a much they're, higher they're dollar doing, they're per doing, unit. Well, they're doing some class model smarter. and they're doing personal training and they're really pumping that. And so the thing is, a lot of gym owners don't want it to. They want to do the group class model only. In okay, which case, we just we just go look. You'll well, never you'll never break half a million a year. Uh, you tell them you're straight up about it. Yeah, it's just and don't. It's, you, it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Highly unlikely. Like yeah. that's that's a hustle. It well, it reminds me of like the the group X model that way. You, you want to ignore the whole personal training side and connecting to the people and helping fixing each one individually. And it's just, let's bust these classes in and out. That's kind of like that model, I feel like, when you... Yeah, what CrossFit uh, has has done is gotten coaches to be able to manage more than one athlete at a time effectively. So some coaches just have more capacity than others. So most coaches can handle one, maybe. Um but there's def- and but if you look at the staff who CrossFit level one staff and you see them coach some of those really great coaches, you can give them 12 to 15 people and they can coach highly effectively. Um, Do you know how many boxes there are in the U.S. called CrossFit? I think around 10,000. Jesus wow. Christ. That many. I did not know that. Now, are they growing? Has it flattened out? So uh, the growth has slowed in the U.S. and really ramped up internationally. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, it's still growing. It's just not growing at the rate it was. Well, it's 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 finally getting a little competitive because I, I I remember God, I remember when there was only five, you know, and then I remember literally now where it seems like there's one on every corner. I yeah, mean, it's it's rare to be able to find, well, especially in big cities like we live in, uh, three miles apart from the next one. I mean, they're, literally, they're not they're not just competitive with each other. But now you have Orange Theory. You have. Barry's Boot Camp. You have these other fran- you have these franchises that take the parts of CrossFit that people like, mm-hmm. and they and they f- they fucking systemize it, make it look beautiful and easy and fun, and dress it up. And that's going to be the competition for the CrossFit. So box. I was part of mm-hmm. the first OTF in the Bay Area, and my buddy owns like seventeen of them, and mm-hmm. he kind of called on called on me to help him start it up and stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do that. Sounds cool. I'm interested in it. I saw the business model. That's what I was. What I saw was they did, and, and you know, Barry's Boot Camp. Or there's quite a few. There's several different franchises that are similar to this. But where I saw that uh, CrossFit was kind of lacking on the the business side and the organization, and like, and then uh, they 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 scaled back, so it's a lot safer. There's no Olympic lifts going on inside there, and stuff. right, right. So I, I was like, oh, this is smart. This they're gonna ride. They're really riding the CrossFit wave, you know, just, sure. in a, just in a different way. You know, they they took they so, somebody was smart enough to see the weakness or the areas that you know well, CrossFit was well the growth in fitness and the fitness industry now and it's been like this for a while is not the big box gyms big box gyms hit a particular point uh, they started getting into price wars with each other i mean shit when i was selling memberships oh my god and when i was selling memberships in early 2000s you know an all club membership at 24 fitness was like $45 a month now you can get them for 20 it's crazy uh, how cheap it's gotten no, well because seen, they started I've, just price warring each other a, i've seen uh gym selling for $10 a month oh yeah oh yeah certain oh, parts of the country we, we, we certain had, parts of the country it's like 10. we had a year where we what? went it was 49 you a year on? There, i have all my family and friends on a $49 a year fucking membership well it's for the whole 20. it's the whole sell you know a shit ton of memberships volumes that <laughs> nobody's ever going to use but make it so cheap that people perceive the value to keep it more than the value. You know whose models, just, you know whose models model, like yeah. that is uh, Planet Fitness. You got you to oh laugh God. when you see that, Fuck right? It, Dude, it's so yeah. crazy. It's so, you know what, though? From a marketing, you got to respect it. For, it's so brilliant what they're doing, right? It's, they're just, it's, it's definitely... Uh, it's so dirty, dude, though. It definitely highlights, cool. where, it highlights where most people are at. Yeah. He's just like, 
All right. This is what most people think is acceptable. You know what? It's growing, bro. Interesting. It's it's growing. Well, being being, at a very fast rate right now. I don't know what to think about that. (laughs) I'm going to have to process that one. I was was just going to say, being sensitive and empathetic. When you think of Planet Fitness, <laughs> that's got to be a challenge. I mean, I mean, I know it is for me when I'm in. I'm, I really care about the fitness and wellness for, you know, uh, for people. But yeah, when you see uh, Planet Fitness, it's uh, God, man, it's like they feed into it so much. But I mean, they're, I'm sure they're doing some good for a lot of people too. But boy, does it make me want to. You know, well, I, I want to go in just, there. And there's just, just all different just levels, you know. All there's, alarms. You know, some people just you know they need it by the inch, you know. I can't take the whole thing at once. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you got lube. And Excellent and it's a party. Yeah. And Planet, Planet Fitness is the, the lube, you know. Yeah. Well, I just think yeah. I think it it I think they're, 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 they're they know they know that okay, first of all, if every member showed up at a twenty four hour fitness or golds or lifetime fitness. They go out of business, they'd have to shut the doors. Yeah, they, Too they, many people. You, no way. they would be shut down for sure. Because you can't even fit that many people in there. So the models are already well, they we're them. counting on you not showing up, which no one tells you that right we sell you on now you want to come in but in reality we don't really want you to show up please don't come back (laughs) because if you if you all did if like if if we did our jobs really well and you all came all the time we would be fucked we wouldn't have a place large enough for all that and they feed into that right past the fire uh code they feed into that they feed into that mentality in, in contrast small boxes because you've seen this growth uh you know recently but it's probably been now we've probably seen this over the last 10 years even it's it, it went from the huge big box competition to the price wars to now you get these shitty gyms people pay for don't use small boxes open up charge more money and they need you to use the gym that's their model we need you to come in and work out or else you quit oh, yeah otherwise you quit because you're paying yeah. 150 200 300 dollars a month or whatever so it's a completely different model but it's more successful it's built on relationships yes it's built on relationships yes you're seeing more yoga studios you're seeing more you know, all matters oh, yeah. of fitness, you know, yeah. small box type f- facilities. For uh, sure. And uh, I couldn't be more happy. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's exciting because, yeah, I, I think it is more about relationships in that case. And the thing about the big box gym or the big box gyms is they're selling hope. Yeah. They're not selling results. They're not selling coaching or relationships. They're selling hope. And the people who buy hope are mainly driven by fear. So if you if you look at people who really like are attracted to a hope message, it's people who usually just don't know what else to do, mm-hmm. so and they just they they're afraid. And someone says hope over here, and like mosquitoes. So the um, yeah, there's a lot of other ways to look so, at it than just gyms. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so there's just saying. So you know you got to think about going back to the beginning. I was talking about the marketing is changing to be less fear-based, you know, less about saying you're not enough so you have to buy this product because you're too insecure, mm-hmm. right? And so moving more towards a message that's not fear-based. And so, um, yeah, I, I think you're going to see certain brands attract a certain type of person and other brands attract another kind of person. It's, oh, it's happening. It, it's a revolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we, when we first started Mind Pump, you know, over two years ago, we talked about this and we talked about the merging of wellness and fitness, and we talked about uh, social media's impact and how realism is really going to be the future, yeah. and how uh, you know supplements, the whole selling the you know lose thirty pounds, and you know look at our bottle of crazy chemicals to build muscle. How that's going to start slowly phasing out as people are going to start becoming more informed. I I remember selling memberships uh, in gyms and. A lot of the sales tactics and a lot of the ways that th- that that we were taught to sell memberships was like the stereotype of car salesman. It was right. the whole yeah. last day is today, and that's always every day. And it was the whole you know, let me <laughs> get my out manager. Of business sale. Let me go get my manager to lower oh, the shit. price. And we're it was like, business. and it was blowing people out the door if they didn't want to join. And it was effective. Uh, it was effective just mainly because nobody in gyms really knew how to sell, so it was better than what was your competition and. Because nobody could really communicate to each other that this gym, you know, was kind of don't don't well, go there and, or whatever. And, and thing, now you can't do that no, shit. No, like, well, things like and two the, seconds the later, you're on Yelp was, and you're fucked. The beginning, yeah, the beginning of that was Yelp. Was Yelp was yeah. when we started to see that, and what we see now with social media. So, what, did, Mike? What's your take on that? I love hearing like guys that are the same age as us that have uh, have had to evolve 
their entrepreneurship with social media. Because when I, I was an entrepreneur by, by 20 years old, so I was already doing things before fucking Twitter or Instagram or any of that shit existed. Yeah. What has that been like for you in that whole transition? You know, I, I, I've always been an early adopter. Uh, so were you like early Facebook guy and everything when it first yeah. came? Oh, you were? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, yeah, I had like the first um, Google phone, the oh. G1. Um, yeah, and that's why, that's why I got into CrossFit, really. If you oh. think about it, I'm an early adopter. I feel like as soon as it came out, I was using it pretty well before it became like a thing you had to learn. So it was just like I've always been engaged in it. I don't know. It, I, I really was it like a natural progression then for you, or was like yeah. it was like what? Wow, this is another tool I have that yeah. I wouldn't even have thought I'd have, or it wasn't sure. even. Uh, yeah, a, a, wow. I just, good for I, you. Man. I just love connecting with people. I just saw it as another way to connect with people. Good for you. I mean, because we have like strategies for making friends on Facebook and shit. Well, I, I for <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like cinema poke. Like <laughs> who does that? Does no, he no, send pokes? What the I'll fuck sh- is that anyway? Yeah, poke me, dude. Yeah, but I mean, like, like uh, my, where my, are you poking my, me? my strategy is yeah. I go to parties, and then anyone who I meet that I like, I friend them at the party on my phone, and then when I get home, if I like them, then I send them a message and be like, Doo-doo-doo. and then if I didn't like them, I just unfriend them. Okay. <laughs> but like, <laughs> <laughs> this sounds and they know this sounds so groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> so I meet somebody if I like them, real I friend them. <laughs> And then I say, yeah, hello. When I get home, I, I don't well, like, I like you. There you go. Or well, fuck you. That's well, it, kids. It's a wrap. You guys know everything it, you man. need to know about growing a social media you business. Know, most people don't do that, simple. though. Most He's people right. don't do that. <laughs> most people right. go to a fucking party. They never ask to be friends on Facebook. You're or right. if they do, they don't. It's not accompanied by a message right. talking about how much they enjoyed your company. And then it's the same your, fucking like, rules oh, just apply. Yeah, yeah, you're awesome. It's called etiquette. Yeah, what I'm finding. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, I never learned that. Uh, well, right, I still fuck up all the time. <laughs> what I what I find is that just by the time I figure out one fucking platform, a new platform pops up, and they're like, "Oh, you use Instagram? Yeah, remember Periscope? <laughs> you're so old. It, it has gotten uh, frustrating. That was a thing. I, I do feel like I have to post all the time, and I, I would say the. M- I just did while we were talking. If it totally I, reminded if, me. If I didn't, if I didn't have the business, I wouldn't be posting anything. Oh, same. Yeah, oh, yeah, I think same we're all like that. Yeah. I think that's. I think though that I still post flexing pictures. I think those, those are cool. balance. It's a tough balance. I, I, I think that's that. you know. So how do you advise someone like that? Because I, I I feel the same way too. But then you have that younger generation that it's it's so much of their social life and how they how they. So connect. I, I use Facebook a lot for my social life. Actually, okay. like, I actually don't use that for much business. I use my Instagram more for business, but. Um, I don't, I'm not real big on commenting on people's shit and I don't care if people comment on my shit. It's just for my events. And so I get invited to parties. Mm -hmm. So like my entire party schedule is run off of Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So priorities. Yeah. I was like, yeah, someone's having a gathering at a house or, or this or that. Nothing crazy, Mm. but, uh, all the time. But the, uh, yeah, it's just like, that's how I keep up with my social calendar. I guess you could say, it's like, oh, we're going to all get together. But aside from that, I really don't care about Facebook. That's the only thing I use it for. Well, that's fucking rad. Now, do you do you attribute um, a lot of your traffic and success from the social media, or do you think it's all from podcasts or your web or like where- primarily podcasts? Okay, so I think you know we're okay on social media. Um, we're building a better strategy this year, but we're we as people who are running the business naturally gravitate towards podcasts. Hmm. It's just a, it's where, it's where our strengths at. You know, uh, a lot of people who are in this business do a lot of email marketing. We do too, and we do Facebook ads, and we do we do a lot of things. And this and podcast is definitely seen as a marketing tool by a lot of people. But just like any other marketing tool, I think everybody gravitates more to one than others. Mm-hmm. You know, some people are just they could never do podcasts, and they just crush social media. Mm-hmm. And some people hate social media, but they can fucking crush email marketing. I don't know how they do yeah. it. But you know that's going to go away. They're going to have to just move to ads. Mm-hmm. But um, YouTube and YouTube is another monster. YouTube, YouTube YouTube's as well. insane. So you know, and we use YouTube. You know, we film everything. That's right. I did see you guys yeah, had quite so, a quite a few subscribers because of that. How, did you guys start filming your podcast from day one? Day one. Oh so, shit, you did early on. Yeah. So it's been on. Congratulations. Five years. Being smart to see that right yeah. from the very beginning. Well, I mean, it, you. I'll tell you what's. what's I don't know if I. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I saw it or if it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> He's, an idiot. He's an idiot. He's an idiot, Servant. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, YouTube's crazy. I made a lot of really good decisions for no reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes you make bad ones. Uh, YouTube's crazy. The, the market for children on YouTube is fucking insane. I have young kids, and my daughter will watch these channels. Uh, oh, yeah. And there's like millions of views on these, ch- these videos, and it's all targeting like kids under eight. And, and then you look up the, the owners of these YouTube channels, and they're millionaires. Yeah, my, and it's um, stupid shit, by the way. My it friends' is not kids, anything good. my friends' kids almost always have iPads. Makes sense. They don't watch TV no more. It's all internet stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's all YouTube. Yeah, that's all I, I watch. Isn't they just watch what uh, they want? Just watch the internet. Porn. porn. I just watch the internet. <laughs> <laughs> porn. <laughs> <laughs> I've been taking a porn break. <laughs> you need to do that, mm. by the way, dude. Yeah. It's been so it's good. Important. So good for my sex life, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm. He sensitizes <laughs> you. They actually found that the the that it trains your brain to. Because we always seek novelty so much that if you keep doing it over and over again, that normal stuff doesn't work. Well, the other thing is, is I think this, this is what I think happens. <laughs> you get worse and worse. Yeah. Well, this is what real I think fast. happens is it causes real sex to get more boring, and then the porn has to get more exciting, right? And weird. So if you <laughs> no, yeah, no. You. you've watched a lot, bro. <laughs> no. You've watched a lot. Listen, That's it. everybody. Yeah, 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 everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. listening to this podcast knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you start, you start with some normal everybody. porn, and you end up watching some crazy shit. It of just course. that's the progression, of course. But if you pull the porn out completely, next thing, this is what I found to be true: is you will then start challenging yeah. your your actual sex life, mm-hmm. yeah. and that's and way adding, more fun way more fun, way more rewarding. The thing is, is most people don't even know what's possible. They don't know what they don't know because they've always had porn. Yeah. And so you pull the plug on porn for three months and then focus on fucking in real life. (laughs) And I promise you probably won't want to go back. And then it gets weird. (laughs) Yeah. Honey, why'd you bring the goat? What? Yeah. Uh... (laughs) Yeah, check out. Uh, wow, that was a good say, insight, Yeah, I mean, man. if you want, if you want like a kickstart, like you're like, oh, I don't have a partner or anything like that, just go to. Uh, and you want to learn more about connecting with another person sexually? Go to uh, orgasmic meditation. Check that out. Hold on a second. Meditating with <laughs> orgasms. Uh huh. I'm sold. Well, think about a lot of times, like one actually, the- actually, if you think about it, orgasm is probably the most present that most people have ever felt. If yeah, they, really lose think their, about they lose their sense of self. Yeah. And they actually do brain imaging on women and they show that 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 is exactly what's happening. You're just there. Do you speak in tongue at the same time? <laughs> yeah, and and this the self Diesel Bob. <laughs> <laughs> this the self, that happens the self anyway. is what creates time. So. That that part of your brain is what creates time. And then if you can if you can put somebody in a that connected orgasmic state, then they can lose track of time. And and it's it, timeless. It, yeah, and then presence expands, and then yeah, it's, it's a meditative experience, and they actually let go mm-hmm. in the moment. Orgasm. It's what, did, what was the website? You, and you rub it out at the <laughs> same time. Huh? How's this work? What's it called? What was orgasmic it? meditation. Yep. Oh, just Google that. Just Google orgasmic meditation. I think it's om dot org. O m dot org. Maybe they call it oming. So uh, I'm. Yeah. So they so, talk. So, they, so, I, I, I just gotta be just, a meme out there, I gotta, bro. I just I, looked this up. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, gonna, right blow, I'm gonna blow your mind. I'm gonna blow your mind. All right, go. All right. So uh, once you've been through the course, you. Oh, it's a course. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take this like at a <laughs> yoga facility or something? That's where some of them. You're, happen. you're pretty close. Yes. I'm gonna be honest with you right now. You're pretty close to being my favorite guest. Yeah. <laughs> almost. <you're> almost <laughs> like, oh, that's that's yeah. the nudge I needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Get to the oming. <laughs> yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, so you attend the workshop. Now, after the workshop, you get... By the way, there's hands-on in the workshop. Oh. Optional. Okay. So... Um, Justin signed up. I yeah. I'm listening. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, you can join a community online. Oh, wow. And let's just say I had a profile... <laughs> let's just say <laughs> all let's in hypothetical. Let's just say yeah. I have a friend. Yeah. Okay. There's this guy. And, he had a beard. And there's there's a lot there's a lot of women where I le- live, and um, a lot of times they're looking for a partner to own with, and so they can just send you a message and be like, "Hey, would you like to own with me?" Wow. And I can be like, "Yeah, how about how does seven o'clock on Tuesday sound?" Hmm. Oh, is on. There you go. And 
This is the Adams, Adams. Brilliant business <laughs> model. <laughs> Brilliant business model. Oh, dude. I did not think of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Why? It's like, Adam, uh, Adam, what's I've that app it. called? What's the app called? Uh, uh, Tinder. 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 Yeah, it's like Tinder oh, meets. Oh, you know, t- Tinder. <laughs> so Tinder, you know, they used to have a, a one like that, but it was for threesomes. So not a lot of people. It knew was this. called Tinders. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you guys, you guys remember? Like do you remember Adult Friend Finder? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or a grandpa. I'm just yeah. kidding, bro. Yeah. It's so funny. I've seen we that look in your. Boat. I've Who? seen that look in your eyes before, Adam. It's the look of dollar signs. Mom, <laughs> I know. I know. He's, he's like, holy shit. Yeah. Who, have, have any of you guys had uh, profiles on Adult Friend Finder? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, my, no. my profile. Our listeners are googling. Don't right look now. up Salami yeah. Skabone. <laughs> <laughs> my profile name was Matrock. Oh, okay. What was <laughs> oh. <laughs> my, uh, the last second too. <laughs> Wait a minute. So my nickname. So when I did when I was heavy in jujitsu, my nickname was Matraca, which is I had a br- <laughs> Brazilian coach. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's an awesome nickname. I know, by the way. I that's that's just, bro, that just sounds I fucking am a awesome. <laughs> yeah, you just like show the parties. Like, I was, like, women just hello. Like, I'm a trucker. <laughs> it's like on your like written on your back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so your name was Matraca. It. Matraca. It's uh, it's Portuguese for chatterbox. Okay. And so <laughs> that's what makes me a good podcaster. And so <laughs> um, and so I made my. Uh, my name, my name on that was Matraka Shaka. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of myself. <laughs> uh, it worked so well. It just came to it me too. I didn't have to think yeah, that hard. Have, it's, it's there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just that's, uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I actually trained one of the that's execs awesome. for Adult Friend Finder. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. I can't wish I care. I can't remember her name, oh, but she was the one who first. I didn't even know it existed as a business, yeah. and she was like, "Oh yeah, no, it's so great. If you fly to Dallas, you just pull up a profile. I'll tell you. I'll tell there. you. I'll tell you what, man. There seems to be another sexual revolution going on right now. That's that's very similar to the one that happened in the '60s and '70s, but different at the same time. It seems to be growing. Well, I think that the same thing's happened with psychedelics. The difference is... is oh, they go together. With, yeah, they yeah. go together, dude. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, this being the second wave um, means that there's a whole, there are elders to learn from. And that's what people missed in the 60s. Um, Maybe they can keep us from the same uh, that's a, God, that's a very good point. There's the people yeah. here now that... That's why you have books like Stealing Fire where they're talking about hedonic calendars. It's a made-up thing. That well, dude, like, the pro- here's how there's so many keep, books keep, on it now. And, and the thing is, is if you go into South America and you look at some of the indigenous people in North America too, they, ha- they have these... Uh, there's, there are these practices, or not even there, just there's... There's sexual practices and there's sexual tantric practices. Mm-hmm. If we're talking about tantric, if we're th- talking about psychedelics, we could be talking about uh, plant medicines down in South America. And the thing that separates them from us is they have elders, <clears throat> you know, and, and sexual practices, they have elders. And when they, in these plant medicine practices, these shamans and ayahuascaros, there's, you know, elders that have taught them. There's a lineage. And when we made all these, uh, Discoveries in the '60s with psychedelics, there were no elders. Yeah, just a bunch of kids everyone, getting high as fuck and having fun. Yeah, everyone <laughs> just went crazy. Well, and I that's think, and I think that's one reason it got shut down. And now we're entering an age where it's emerging again, and both with sexuality and psychedelics, both. And it's one of those things that they're just taboo. Mm-hmm. They are taboo things that are, and one of the reasons they're taboo is because they're so powerful, mm-hmm. and people don't know how to really manage it. And there's a lot of fear around it because of because of the power, and if we don't know what to do with it, let's just suppress it, well, and that's not the right answer. Well, the 60s, the sexual revolution and the psychedelic revolution of the 60s <clears throat> led to the excesses uh, of the 70s. It was this fire that just wasn't, that just burned, and people, it turned into, and you hear it in the music, by the way, but if anybody ever wants to hear the progression of the psychedelic consciousness expanding counterculture movement, you listen to the music and you can hear the trends in the music. And it went from, you Just know, listen to the Beatles from, from their uh, first yeah. album to, to their yeah. last. And you're just like, Stark. You can, the white album. You're just like, Whoa, yep. Yep. they got yeah. in there. You, <laughs> and then it, and then it turned into, <laughs> and then it turned into <laughs> disco and cocaine. And, yeah. and then, and then it turned into yeah. hair metal, metal bands and excess, uh, in the eighties. And, uh, it was the counterculture, um, and there was a war against the counterculture because we, of course, viewed it viewed the counterculture as a 
a threat to national security. But here's the bigger, here's another big difference with today is today it's not the counterculture. Today it's the it's the people with the power. Yeah, Elon now, Musk. Now you've got CEOs, fucking, yeah, you've got big, you got big name guys that are that's right, and who are now looking at these things, examining them, and you've got science is open a little more now. It was not <coughs> shut down as much. Yeah. And so I hope that the pendulum doesn't do what it did before, where it went wah, went went over here and there was no balance and you had problems. And I think we're in a better position today. Yeah, I, I think we're um, I think we're approaching a huge shift. Big time. Like it's, I agree. There's so many things happening simultaneously. We're talking about two things. We have virtual reality oh, there's coming way on. more stuff. Right? Live, live, the fact that live streaming and, and virtual reality are, are basically emerging simultaneously, mm. none of us in this room can wrap our heads around like, no, what, <laughs> what that impact looks like. You know what that, you know that, that impact looks like to me? It looks like that movie with fucking Bruce Willis. Where people plug in and just surrogates, yeah, surrogates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That they don't they don't even want to leave their they don't even want to leave. Uh, that's what we are right they now, dude. They don't want to. That's ever, already happened, though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's gonna be it's gonna be so accessible that like it, you could literally. Yeah, we're gonna do it again. Yeah. Yeah. On, on a, I wonder how many layers deep we are. At least seven. Actually, well, hold least, on. Well, you yeah. come up with that. Yeah, like, Is that why Taco like, Bell came out with that seven layer burrito? <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Taco Bell! <laughs> <laughs> not six that the Illuminati is in Taco Bell. Is that what yeah. you? Yeah, I'm putting why it all together. Where now. did you, well, you said it so well, fast, bro? It's like a certain <laughs> seven, it's seven layers. Seven, like, like, not six, not know. five. They made well, bean dips around it for sure. They're actually densities. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's at a different layer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, I heard Don't that, worry about it. You're on five. I heard there was thir- I'm I heard too there was dense 13. to pick up on that. There was thir- <laughs> <Yeah>. wow, <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> Talk to me when you get to seven, bro. Yeah. Son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm like three, maybe. Well, you officially um, become my favorite guest. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we've achieved that. Yeah. Uh, Jeez, thanks man. for giving me the nudge. I appreciate uh, it. Uh, excellent. <laughs> well, hey, man, this has been fucking awesome. Yeah. Good yeah, time talking to you, brother. Yeah, no, yeah. we'll do this more. Yeah, no, we for will. Sure. 100%. You got to come visit us. Yeah. Come visit. yeah. We have a whole recording studio and we'll have a good time there. Shoot video. We, we can have do party audio. treats. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Stop yeah. it, Justin. Let's what? Do it. <laughs> Definitely. Horn. Excellent. I'll sign us off. Uh, check it out. Go to mindpumpmedia.com. 30 days of coaching still available for free. Also, find us on Instagram at mindpumpradio. You can find my personal page at mindpumpsal, Adam's at mindpumpadam, and Justin's at mindpumpjustin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.